This episode is brought to you by Amazon Prime. There's nothing sweeter than baking cookies during the holidays. With Prime, I get all my ingredients delivered right to my door, fast and free. No last minute store trips needed. And of course, I blast my favorite holiday playlist on Amazon Music. It's the ultimate soundtrack for creating unforgettable memories. From streaming to shopping, it's on Prime. Visit Amazon.com slash Prime to get more out of whatever you're into. Welcome to the Supreme Resort Land View World, a podcast about Disneyland and Walt Disney World, and which is the Supreme Resort. Almost on beat. Each episode, we will discuss and explore each ride. Each episode, each epi- oh, nope, don't cut this. Each resort, ride by ride, land by land, park by park, horsey dwarf by horsey dwarf to determine which is better, Disneyland or Walt Disney World. I'm Dan, and thank you for joining me on this quest to help the greater good of humanity answer that very long, elusive question. Joining me, as always, from Scraping the Vault, we got Jimmy. Hello, everybody. I like Haribo gummies. I just put one in my mouth. (laughs) Breaking his own rule about hearing people chew. Uh, And from, uh, I almost said from Jimmy, why not? From Jimmy, we have Eric. (laughs) I drink water. (laughs) Uh, Eric is also from Boys Planning, as well as about eight other podcasts. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also this one. Also this one. That's why he's here. Funny Yay. how that works. <laughs> um, yeah, Jimmy, you were How's saying- How's that gummy? Is it is it really chewy? Mm-hmm. So chewy. Haribo, the chewiest of the gummy bears, mm-hmm. also a client. Oh. Mm-hmm. I have the f- Fantastic Mix. So what? this today is the beginning of the seventh week of me not drinking alcohol. Nice. And uh, gummies or su- anything sugary has replaced it. I've they say you're supposed happens. to lose weight when you stop drinking. Oh, no. <laughs> no, your body proved them wrong. that sugar. <laughs> oh, uh, let me tell you. Jimmy, feel free yep. to answer this off the podcast. Has it gotten any easier? Um, the not drinking? Yeah. Yes. Nice. There. There are, so I think because I just decided I wasn't doing it, it was never really hard. Mm -hmm. Um, The first two weeks I was traveling with family, there was not alcohol around. Mm -hmm. Um, It's only like occasionally, like maybe once every couple of weeks, like, oh my God, I want to drink right now. But then I think about tomorrow Mm -hmm. and I think about how productive I am at night and how productive I am in the morning and Mm -hmm. how fresh and refreshed I am. Mm. It's just, I put it out of my head. Hmm. So sleep is a little bit challenging for me, but, um, right. you know, in and out up and depends on the day. So, oh, I'm just hitting oh. my laptop. But yeah, uh, so yeah. it's, it's really been nice. I'm next in line for that adventure. I, I, I agree. Sleep is the hardest part, the weirdest part. And I don't generally drink to sleep, but. That's mm. all I ever did. Um, yeah, the habit. It's just like I come home from work and I mm-hmm. drink. All right. Hey, yep. whatever. Who cares? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm not going to I'm not being smug about it. I'm not going to put any judgment. I don't care. My wife drinks wine, I don't know, probably every day if not every other day whatever. And I, you know, I like it for her because she doesn't have a problem and so I don't I don't I really actually kind of encourage it. Just, you know, do your thing. You know, if it makes yeah. you happy, go for it. I just don't have I've been saying for years I don't know that I have a moderation button and I don't so mm-hmm. it's either all or nothing, and so nothing it is. Are you right. going to change for you. To what you recommend for scraping the vault? Um, what do you mean? Because you usually recommend a beer. Are you going to now recommend like a non-alcoholic beer? Or no, no, I'll like still do it. Pop there's a, no, there's like a very delicate ginger beer. that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll still continue with the beer because that's the tradition. If I mix it up, it won't be because I don't drink it. But right. anyway, it's, um, you know. I, I I won't say anything else about it. It's a choice that I made for myself, and I'm happy Stop I did. Stop shoving it down our throats. We get it. We understand. Yeah. Don't think yeah. anyone should drink All right. it. I fine. have something real quick, unrelated yes. to anything to do with the show. Okay. Um, we have, my wife and I, we have a 12-year-old fridge that we bought when we first moved into this house, okay? I thought you were going to say a 12-year-old child. And- <laughs> well, we have a 13-year-old child with a 12-year-old fridge, <laughs> mm-hmm. both of which we're trying to get rid of. 
<laughs> anyway, so both are broken beyond repair. <laughs> anyway, I'm joking. I love you, Alex. Okay, so um, what happened was it's 12 years old. Uh, it's, it's a side by side, and it's got multiple drawers. You know, and the doors of the drawers have broken off, so we don't actually have any drawers per se. The things that slide mm. out, but everything in them slides out beforehand. Hmm. It's time. My wife is a very, very frugal, very responsible person. Um, thank God for her and Boring. everything we do. I know. <laughs> so she's incredibly frugal, very responsible. She will take months and months researching what's the best, when's it on sale, like, you know, just one of those things. Part of it's procrastination, but mostly it's just, you know, let's be frugal as possible. Okay. I say all that to say, we've kind of been budgeting. It's going to cost us $2,000, $2,500 to buy a new fridge, okay? Mm -hmm. What we want you know, she wants that, you know, anymore, you know, side by side is sort of the newer thing is the side by side fridge with the pull out drawer freezer on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And she wants a four door. So the side by side French door refrigerator on the top, a middle drawer that can be converted into a freezer. Mm. Uh, and then the bottom drawer is a f uh, the freezer. So you've got a convertible in the middle, blah, blah, blah. So we've, I have we one went, of those. Yeah. We spent an hour and a half yesterday at Home Depot, like hands on poor kids. And then today we went to Best Buy. Touching drawers. Is yeah. it cold enough? <laughs> so she wants a counter depth. Anyway, long story short, all this time, I mean, we've been talking about this for months. Uh, it all kind of stemmed from the water filter that you push to get water on the door. It broke, it, meaning that it just kept running. Like <laughs> middle of the night without anybody touching it, it would just run and water would just. So I had to undo the water. So we've been buying like jugs of water. And I'm like, you know, if we do this 2,000 more times, we may as well just buy a fridge. So we finally make the decision today and we found the one we wanted. We went to home to Best Buy, sorry, Home Depot to buy the fridge. This fridge is $3,200. Okay. Um, this one's got a little, it's got a little like a see-through th door. So if you oh. tap the door, then you can see what's inside the fridge. And the kids, of course, Don't that's what they wanted because it's like a screen. So we're like, well, it's $200 to not get that, that six months after the kids bring all their friends in to knock on our fridge is going to break. So at some point, it doesn't matter. Let's just not spend the $200, get a stainless steel fridge, do all that, go to buy it. Um, then she found while we were waiting to buy, she found at Costco, the thing is $50 cheaper. So she's like, do you guys price match? Yes, we do. Bring the manager over. We get our $50 discount. And when I'm checking out, the manager who overrode, because they don't do Costco, they didn't do pri Costco price matches until recently. There you go, listener, pro tip. Uh, so he overrode the price. So now instead of being $29.99, it was $21.49, right? Ooh. $50 off. As the manager overrode the discount, he typed in $1949 instead of $2949. <gasps> <laughs> All right. Uh -oh. So this $3,000 fridge is now in our budget of $2,000. Listener, what do you Don't do? Ask them. Don't ask them. <laughs> Did you speak up? What do you do? Ethical challenge here, everybody. Uh, please, um, please, while you're considering this, please say out loud while you're in your car yes. driving to work, please say what you would have, uh, what you would have done. Yep. Press one if you would have not said a word. <laughs> Press two if you would be do the honest thing and tell the kind clerk that he made a mistake. Now, I think also, podcast listener, go ahead and pause this episode and discuss with people around you. Ask them what they would do. What the, right. and what they think the ethical thing would do. Find and somebody at the bus stop. Find yeah. find a spouse. Find a coworker. Find. Find a, an unhomed person who might have an opinion that, that you want to listen to. Find that guy who hosts What Would You Do on like CBS or something. And that's 100% oh, what I thought, that perhaps we were on a secret video show. <laughs> what Would You Do? Uh-huh. All right. Did, now that we have all your answers, the theme song? What, let's find what out what you happened. Do? <laughs> I, can't I, I think that was the theme song. Lester Holt or something? Anyway. No, um, it's not Lester Holt. It's, uh, hold on. I'll look it up. Was okay. it a gumble? So, Eric, I'm going to ask you, was it a gumbel? How many gumbels are there? <laughs> there are two. Bryant. And anyway. Rick. Um, 
Eric, the under the goal? circumstances, I painted a picture of my incredibly well-researched frugal wife. And um, what would you have done? I would have absolutely said, uh, hey, hey, uh, I, uh, I, hate to, <clears throat> I hate to say it, but uh, you keyed that in wrong. You're, you're off by a grand. Um, mm-hmm. And I would have felt very good when he was like, oh, oh. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, thank you so much for saying it. I would have felt great. I would have. Okay. Yeah. That's what Let I would have done. Let me add a little bit of nuance to Uh-oh. this conversation. <laughs> After the manager overrode and saved us $1,000. <laughs> the, the, sales- the manager cheated on. What would you do? Nice. Oh no, that's not the right. That's not. That's not the right show. That's okay. Not, are, are you going to um, give context that with that like the the manager like hit on your wife? No, nope. The manager <laughs> like, was nope, very put out it. by the whole thing. He was not friendly at all. <laughs> he came in, typed his buttons, walked away. Oh. The salesman at that point said, "Wow, that's a really good price. You guys are getting a really good deal." <laughs> But and this, this is a deal. Dan, we got Eric's answer. Dan, uh, what would you do? Um, I work in the education industry. <laughs> as somebody who works in the education industry, I am, of course, uh, bound b- by law and professionalism <laughs> to of course, always do the right thing and always I, okay. I can tell you what I would not do as okay. an educator. This is exactly what I would not do is I would absolutely not pretend to not notice because okay. that would be a bad thing to do. Okay. Okay. All right. Now that we have everybody's answers on the board, <laughs> um, here's what uh, happened. Listener, listener, please. Um, Say no, they've already loud, submitted their answers. What you would do? <laughs> they already did that. They already, oh, one yeah, for okay. one for not saying anything. Two for, anyway. I go um, pull out my phone and start distracting. <laughs> okay, I'm, I would <laughs> not pull out my phone and start distracting myself by like, oh look, I'd leveled up an, an Angry Birds. You play this oh, game? <laughs> oh, the listeners are the, the listeners have they, they have, have added their opinion. Okay, uh, they have spoken, and uh, the answer is four. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know what four corresponds to. So I am going through, if you've ever purchased had any kind of appliance purchases or anything at Best Buy, there's questions. Do you want to donate to St. Jude? Do you want to? So I'm going on the keypad. I'm answering my questions as we mm-hmm. are aware that this is $1,000 cheaper than we expected. Mm-hmm. Um, are we sure this is the right fridge? Yes, we've confirmed this is, in fact, the same part number. It's the same fridge. I'm going through the buttons. The salesperson has acknowledged the fact that we're getting a very good deal on this fridge. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. The manager overrode it, walked away. My wife did what Eric would have done. She said, that is $1,000 less than the actual price. You're charging us the wrong amount for this fridge. Mm-hmm. What, a, what a delightful that is, person that is, is your wife. That is the right thing to do. My incredibly frugal months into planning for a two thousand dollar fridge told the clerk we are paying a thousand dollars less than we should be, and we paid three thousand dollars for the fridge. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they re overrode it to a five thousand dollar fridge. That's right. And Jimmy, I so can we tell, walked uh, away. Just for the I, feel, I can tell look on your face that you are proud and very happy that we decided to collect it. No. We both said, of course, we'll take it, but you're charging us the wrong amount and hoping that they're like, well, yeah, it's our mistake, right? That's just kind of what you're going for. Yeah, it's our mistake. It's not your problem. Here's your, here's your you know, thousand dollars off. Uh, they did not do that. We spent the full price um, and we decided that karma is, you know, on our side, I guess. And if we had spent a thousand dollars less, the thing would have imploded in like 42 hours or whatever. So <laughs> we paid the money and we got 18 and 18 months, 0% interest. Good job. Best buy. All right, let's move on. Dan, right. this is your show. I'm done. Oh, all okay. right. 
Hey, well, this is this is great. This is the part of the show that people don't want to listen to necessarily. <laughs> Skip ahead. Uh, well, uh, I think it's riveting. It's, it's possible if, if you, some listeners might not want to listen to any of the show because we're talking about restaurants. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a theme lately. Yeah. No rides, no just rides. places to stand and yeah. eat. Yeah, where your born or grandparents who or took set. you to the theme park and were like, well, we could just shop. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, this is the Elias and Brothers Company uh, <laughs> store episode. <laughs> this would look nice on you. Um, right. So I'm in the weird position of, because I'm going to be judging, uh, we're doing Carthay Circle versus. Uh, that is weird. Brown I think Derby. that would be Blue Bayou or Brown Derby versus Carthay Circle, no? Brown Derby was was Brown earlier. Um, yeah. Uh, um. Right. So um, anyway, really weird situation because I'm judging. That means I'm hosting. And we also have uh, two segments that involve me. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Hey, if you, if you, you have want a, to open that mailbag, if, if you have an accurate uh, idea of my psychology, you know how squirmy this is for me. However, I suspect there are many people listening who are like, I bet this douchebag loves this. <laughs> I do not. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, what do you want first, mailbag or some frosted tips? What do you want? You're in I charge. Want mailbag because that involves more of you. Hey, there it is. Uh, welcome back to Dan's Mailbag to Mail. It's a segment that uh, still exists, and uh, we actually got an email from Toy Soldier Mike. Here we go. Toy Soldier Mike says, hey, guys, I just listened to the episode from June 2021, or was it January 9th, 2020? Seems like Jimmy mentioned the date more than a few times. I'm just glad to hear that Dan has recovered from the apparent mushroom trip he was on recently. Or was that his other brother, Billy? I'm a veteran listener of Eric, having heard his, 180, his uh, D-180 is what it's called, right, Eric? Or well, he Disney wrote 180 movie. seconds, right. 180 seconds, 180 <laughs> seconds around the Disney parks on the sweet spot, sweep spot for several months now. Little did I know that he was spending all his waking hours studying Disney parks history when he should have been missing prescriptions, uh, missing prescriptions properly. Uh, don't don't tell still, my boss. <laughs> I still have two and a half years of episodes to catch up. So I should be with you by April Fool's Day, 2024. See you there. It gets better. Uh, this is from Toy Soldier Mike. Uh, he says, uh, P.S. When will Asher be doing a meet and greet uh, soon? Uh, I, I'll, I actually think that if we, whenever we do have a live show or meet and greet, I want to have a uh, um, Asher costume contest to see who. Can. Oh, yeah. I think that'd be fun. That's nice. If you think about it, moose are basically just like if reindeers and cows decided to be the same thing. Basically, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good boy, <laughs> Asher. Um, if I remember correctly, this was that long lost episode from January of 2020. I believe so. Yes. Where yes. I sold all my stock in Purell, I believe. Right, and I sold my stock in, uh, in Zoom. Uh, That's that, was, right. <laughs> that was great. It took uh, me a while to realize what he was talking about. And I went, oh yeah, that was actually a lot of fun. That was yes, fun. Yes, Dan, stop playing with manholes with your nephew. Got it. Uh, and he wrote another email that I'm folding into this one. I, too, work as an educationalist. So sorry to hear about Betty White's passing. One Spira for Disneyland. My greatest concern is that I will never know which identical galaxy's edge remains supreme. Spoiler, it's Disneyland because it has three entrances. Ten Spira for Disneyland. I only have 43 more episodes left to catch up, and I can't wait to hear what happened over the past two years. Well, I give major props to Toy Soldier Mike for uh, knowing what a Spira is. And for uh, actually emailing us because uh, nobody usually does. Yeah. They, well, that's true. People don't email. They do reach out and there they are do. reviews, etc. cetera. Yes. But we don't get a lot of emails. So yeah. listener, you want your email read on the air that you'll hear in six months? <laughs> <laughs> email yep. Eric because he's the only one that gets them. I'm the one that gets them. E. Johnson at concierge.com. Or you could send it to my email, but I don't check it. Just, you know, well, you should know. I do but, check the jhunt at concierge.com. You can email it there. I check yeah. my work email and my personal email, which I'm not giving it on, giving it on the podcast. Okay. Uh, anyway, so that's the mailbag of mail. Uh, zip it up. There it goes. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right. Uh, I'd like to hear some frosted tips. Hold on. Uh-oh. I'm, I'm, I'm going to fold this one in. Okay. Uh, I'm going to Disneyland on Super Bowl Sunday. And Sweet. Is, is that, a, is that a, a text you got on no. X or <laughs> formerly no, Twitter? I'm telling you, I'm telling you to. And I want, because I, oh, okay. we were talking okay. before the show and I said, hold on, hold on, hold on. This is, this is content for the show. Uh, I'm going on Super Bowl Sunday. I don't know whether it's going to be busy or not. What are your predictions? <sighs> Southern California. Mm-hmm. You, I believe personally, it's a Sunday, which historically, well, I don't know what historically means anymore, but it used there's, to be that Sunday afternoon. Currently, yeah, slower time, right? Yeah, I predict it will be more dance than not, meaning there will be a lot of people who go to Disneyland because it's going to be not crowded mm-hmm. because is, of the Super Bowl. Who is playing in the superb owl? Uh, I don't think we know yet. Jets and the turnips and the 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 men. Uh, as um, of January twenty eighth, uh, we probably know today. I think that sure. championship games today. Maybe 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 people watch the footballs tonight. Uh, um, while Jimmy's looking football I, in a while, it, it, Eric. While Jimmy's looking, or if he is looking, doesn't matter one way or the other. Uh, what what do you what your prediction? I'm going to say yeah. it's going to be decent, but there's going to be an abnormally long line at Pirates. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. There, there, All of the people that are there in the parks will be at Pirates. Yeah. I think for some reason it's going to be, I think it's actually going to be busier because people are expecting it to be slower. Okay. And I'm, Calling it now, there's going to be a bunch of dads watching the game on their phones. That part's a guarantee. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as for good. who's in the Super Bowl, let me see. NFL championship. I think it's today. I think it's, there we go. Yeah, it's probably, um, yeah. TBD versus TBD. That's the oh. Super Bowl. TBD. And let's see. I'm one of the standings. Sorry, listener, you very frustrated. Well, while you're looking, I just have a real. So uh, we we decided people. I guess f- from what I've heard from the two of you, people have enjoyed the tips that I gave for visiting Disneyland last episode. Uh, yes, very well received. Oh, yes, yes, very well. My nice. son included. Uh, by the way, it'll be either the Ravens or the Chiefs versus Ooh. either the Lions or the 49ers. The Lions? I know, right? Detroit has made it this far. <laughs> Evidently. What the? Um, yeah, so the Chiefs are currently in the lead. That gives a timestamp for the show, 17 to 7 in the fourth quarter. It's looking good for the Chiefs. And the 49ers and the Lions play very shortly. Mm. Go, let's go. Chief. Turn off this Games. podcast and watch People. the television yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, anyway, yeah, I have no idea what some of those words were that we just said, but um, we. I'm I'm thinking because I did just kind of like spray everyone with the fire hose of knowledge during that last during the segment of tips. Uh, every once in a while, I'm going to present a little something called Dan's Frosted Tips. <laughs> hey, everybody. This is an addendum to the previous yeah. set of tips. Uh, basically, it. the one thing I forgot to say is... Don't forget to look at the lightning lane line <laughs> because if there's a lot of people in it, don't go on it because <laughs> it's not going to be a lightning lane anymore. It's going to just be a line. <laughs> and if you're in standby and then there's a long lightning lane, don't go on it. <laughs> just wait. It's going to chimichunga or something. And then like throw the chimichunga in the trash because those things are terrible. And then... What? You ate one of them. I saw you. <laughs> I was I did too. Drunk. I loved it. <laughs> uh, and then once the lightning lane line is gone, then you can get in the standby line because then they'll be moving the standby line because they do not move the standby line when there's a lot of lightning lanes. Should be obvious, but it's not. And I understand that. So there you go. Whoops, please. Uh, these are my frosted yeah, tips. He'll keep going if you don't turn off the music. I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'll I'll there fade it in post. <laughs> it's very loud. It's very right loud. 
Well, we got music just for that. Uh, anyway, what I was like going to say reminds me of <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of uh, DCA. What's that? Uh, it sounded like the thing. It, it's a carnival atmosphere. Uh-huh. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Oh. Carnival. There's a ride that has that sound. Goofy Sky School. Oh, it used to be the. You know what it reminds me of is Incredicoaster. Before it was Incredicoaster, it sounded like uh, the beginning of uh, oh, California Screaming. Oh, that's right. That's what that's it's right. like. Yeah. Okay. All right. All well, right. Let's start the show. I mean. Okay. <laughs> I I don't want to. I, I mean, I'm tempted, but. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I have, a, I have a large collection of music that I can just <laughs> drop into this. Uh, I apologize, listeners. Uh, please uh, join our Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> for your sub podcast please give us uh two dollars a month a uh, three dollars a month one for each of us <laughs> wrong, wrong show wrong patreon wrong yeah. show yeah, oh, we don't crap. get paid <laughs> um seven dollars one for everybody let's see so we've got one two three okay, that's five, two five. for you it's Six, five dollars for the nine, nine, ten, patreon ten dollars and then two dollars for <laughs> it's two dollars for me always splitting patreon. and one dollar for everybody else Yes. And then you can get access to the <sighs> secret show and the after hours episodes on mm-hmm. patreon.com mm-hmm. forward yeah. slash ears up. And everybody loves after hours. Here's the classic theme. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we literally got a one, a one <laughs> star about the amount of giggling that happens on this show. We have that. fun and we like each other. I'm going to shut move. up. I'm going to move the microphone over to Asher and see if he has anything to say that he's never said before. Oh, boy. Uh, ah, crap. Hang on. <laughs> you don't have to do anything. It's just him. <laughs> I'm sorry. What was that, Asher? <laughs> My cousin says getting married is for girls. That's true. <laughs> are we, are we going to do a show tonight? Sure. Yeah, let's do it. Let's get started. All right. So today we are talking about Carthay Circle and or uh, Brown Derby Restaurant versus Brown Derby Restaurant and or Carthay Circle. Uh, It was Brown Derby was first, right? Uh, Yes. Right. So I have a little template here that uh, Jimmy sent, which is we're going to talk about the history of the thing that inspired the restaurant, similarities and inspirations in the restaurant. Secrets and facts, current menu, changes of the menu, seasonal offerings. Uh, Asher didn't have a chance to do kid menus like everybody loves so much. Oh, uh, original prices on opening day. That sounds like fun. We're doing land impact. And of course, bathrooms. Um, I'm going to start by saying, as I like to kind of where I'm standing on these. Uh, I'm kind of, I don't really have a strong alliance to either of them i've never been to brown derby and i've never dined inside of carthay i have uh done the alfresco lounge which sometimes is great sometimes it's not so great um my what i have heard and this is just what i've heard but you of course you're gonna have a chance to educate me on this is that carthay circle restaurant is generally kind of overpriced and kind of, and can kind of just okay. Um, and Brown Derby I have heard is closer to just regular old theme park food than one might like. However, let's talk about it. Uh, I think, Brown- I think you've misheard. Uh, well, that's fine. Or just as I a person food. who's been there many times. Well, possibly I just heard from big dummies and that's fine. Uh, Eric is going to be uh, talking about Brown Derby. And when he says something that I like, I'm going to, we're all going to hear this sound. Those saccharine, sweet, icky drinks. Those are the ones. <laughs> uh, what's that for? That is an interview with Shirley Temple because the, the Shirley Temple, the non-alcoholic drink was invented at one of the original Hollywood Brown Derbies in California. Ooh. Uh, and Jimmy is arguing for a Carthay Circle. If he says something I like, we are going to hear this sound. Well, I'm so proud. I think I'll bust. 
All right. Now, everyone, <laughs> stop giggling. Uh, just because he said a thing that sounds like a thing doesn't mean we need to be immature about this. It is, of course, when Walt Disney received his honorary special Seven Dwarves Oscar presented by Shirley Temple. Mm-hmm. She said, isn't it neat and shiny? And aren't you proud, Mr. Disney? And he says, I'm so proud. I think I'll bust. Uh-huh. There is a relation to my restaurant. Mm. Ooh, I wonder what it will be. We'll find <laughs> out soon. Uh, Eric, tell us about, wait, you have opening statements. Open those statements. Oh, okay. So we're going to read. <laughs> Let's see here. <laughs> You're not, uh, you're not reading anything. You're giving. The, yes, statements. this is off the top of my. Yes. Off the top of my Because everyone brain. speaks like everyone thinks and speaks just like this. The Hollywood Brown Derby, a star studded legacy. Dine in an authentic replica of the famous Brown Derby, a Tinseltown landmark steeped in glamour and glitz. The walls are adorned with caricatures of famous faces, a tradition that began with the original restaurant. And the upscale atmosphere harkens back to the golden age of Hollywood. Signature dishes. Experience the delectable leg of sea. <laughs> that was the end. <laughs> Signature dishes. We're done. Uh, experience experience the delectable legacy of the original brown derby with timeless dishes and classic cocktails. Savor such specialties as our Faroe Island salmon char grilled filet of beef and our famous Cobb salad that follows the recipe created by Bob Cobb or what? Robert Cobb. That's an actual person. That's Robert Cobb is an actual person who owned the historic California Brown Derby for the. You perfect- thought it was named after Stephen Salad? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just had no idea that it was like that. It wouldn't, the first, okay, there, there's a lot of controversy. His- it might have been Robert Salad. <laughs> it's more that his name is Bob Cobb. That is delightful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Uh-oh. I, hate to, oh, oh, I oh, hate to no. do this. I hate to do this. We're in the intro. <laughs> I got to give a point for that because Bob Cobb <laughs> is wonderful. Oh, Those yeah. saccharine, sweet, icky <laughs> drinks. Those are the ones. I can't, I can't not do that. Oh, no. Like, <laughs> Oh, get ready. Uh, for sure. the Perfect finale to any meal. Explore enticing slate of cakes. Green light the <laughs> green light. Oh gosh, it's a Hollywood term. Green light the grapefruit cake, a brown derby <laughs> original, baking basking in its glamorous citrusy sponginess. I have the story behind that. Or stake your career on a chocolate mousse cake, so decadent with dark chocolate and candied cherries. Guests twenty one of age and up can enjoy classic cocktails. Poor Dableside, in addition to old and new world wines from Italy, France, California, Australia, and beyond. Sample three varieties from around the world with different wine flights. Advanced reservations are highly recommended. <laughs> All right. That was the opening statement. Made up entirely on the spot. By <laughs> I got I a have, point. Me, would you like I to ha- do a similar thing for I would. Carthay now, State? I will say I'm not going to spoil it. Other than um, the Carthay Circle uh-huh. is actually also named after somebody. <gasps> Mr. Circle? Spoilers to come. <laughs> Tim <laughs> Circle. Send, send your circle, please. <laughs> His name is Perkle Circle. <laughs> Perkle Circle. <laughs> <laughs> this is anyway. why people don't listen to our show. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. <clears throat> Transport yourself to Hollywood in the 1930s with a dining experience at Carthay Circle Restaurant and Lounge at Disney California Adventure Park. Inspired by Carthay Circle Theater, the Los Angeles movie theater that premiered Walt Disney's first feature-length animated movie, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. There it is. There's the sound. Uh, 1937. Yes, Enjoy a, a fine point yet. No, no, it's not, it's not a point. It's just there. there's the thing I was waiting for. Yeah. It'll come up again. Mm-hmm. Enjoy gonna, a that, fine dining a experience of, surrounded uh, by the glitz and glamour of the cinematic golden age. Uh, also yours, cinematic golden age, Eric. <laughs> the same Stardust. age of yeah. cinema. <laughs> golden. Stardust lingers in the air with an homage to Hollywood and rich architectural details. But what hidden gems of information can we <laughs> dig up? Say hi ho no, and God. let's look closer. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, why? Why? Because <laughs> the seven dwarfs. I, uh, 
Cause just, just make it a nice place. Okay. Okay. <sighs> you know is what? That it? Point for is that it? Is there or is there more? That's it. Point for brevity. no. That's the whole thing. I'm done. Rest. Point, point <laughs> I rest for, my case. Point for brevity. <laughs> Sweet. Did you really did you get uh, administer a point? Hey, yeah. listen. Bob I mean, it, it, the Bob Cobb thing was. So not. I think I'll bust. Yeah, we're yeah. even. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, opening statements, or we always did that. How about history? Uh, Eric, tell me about the history, history of the thing that inspired the thing. Of the yes. thing that inspired the thing. All right. Well, the original Brown Derby was opened on in February of 1926 at 3424 Wilshire Boulevard. It was owned by Herbert K. Somborn and paid for by Jack Warner of the Warner Brothers Studios. It was shaped like a derby hat. It was a small building that had weird acoustics inside because of the shape of the building. Uh, it closed 10 years later and moved in May of 1936 to a new location at 3377 Wilshire Boulevard. That is a block away. Uh, the the building was was purchased and demolished, and they just did another one down the street. Well, the Hollywood Brown Derby, because the Brown Derby became a franchise, uh, the the one that we see at uh, Hollywood Studios now that opened with the park with the MGM with Disney MGM Studios Park in 1989. The inspiration for that was the uh, the Spanish mission style facade of the building that opened on Valentine's Day, uh, February 14th, 1929, on 1628 North Vine Street in California. This is the location that became the hip place to be if you were in showbiz. Uh, the The building had... It had these these large tables, these these large booths where they could bring a phone to your table, uh, so you could take calls. So celebrities were always there. It was the place to be. They wanted to be seen in this location. Wheels and deals would happen there, and fans would actually send fan mail to this location knowing that people like Clark Gable would be in this building and it was easier than looking up the address of their actual house. So while you were dining in this location, you might get a phone call offering you a new movie deal. You might get a letter from Sandra in Ohio. Who knows Um, around the walls of this location. This is where the caricatures began uh, Jack Lane and Nicholas Volpe were responsible for creating hundreds of caricatures of celebrities in in this restaurant. Uh, Jack Lane's were probably the more significant ones. They these were ink silhouettes where he would do a caricature that kind of outlined the prominent features of folks. Uh, Volpe was known known for his pastel paintings, so these were color paintings and these were later because as we all know color wasn't invented until the 1940s Mm -hmm. Uh, you can actually purchase reproduction images in frame and unframed from the Hollywood Brown Derby these days how much would you think it would cost for an unframed image a reproduction image uh, of a celebrity, I'm guessing. Um, not Jimmy Durante because Jimmy Durante actually has two. He's one of the few who actually has two images because, uh, the characterist, uh, Jack Lane drew one image that was mostly his face. And then a second image that was the rest of his nose. <laughs> oh, that's just offensive. So, um, and what so does how about to Lucille do Ball? Gurus? How much, <laughs> How much would you pay for a Lucille Ball image? Uh, I would pay unlimited amounts personally because I, as you can see from the plate collection behind me, I love Lucy so much. Um, uh, Three hundred. Thirty-five dollars. That's better. I would pay two thousand dollars. My wife would pay three thousand dollars. Oh man! <laughs> Call back. Wow. Uh, Fifty-five dollars <laughs> if you want it framed. Huh? Yeah. 
So these celebrity walls had hundreds of caricatures. This is what the location became known for. This is what inspired the the location at at Walt Disney World. Uh, this location was reported to be the origin of the Cobb salad, as we have alluded to. According to the the classic story, Sid Grauman, owner of the uh, the the theater Grauman's Chinese Theater, where many many uh, movies were premiered. He came in late one night after a dental procedure, and he was having he, he had some pain in his mouth, and he wanted something that was easy to eat, but he also wanted something hearty. So it was Bob with Cobb, eggs and blue cheese, right? Bob Cobb, the owner at the time, used leftovers from the fridge to feed him. He chopped up the greens to make them more palatable, uh, and that's the origin of the Cobb salad with. With greens, with blue cheese, with turkey, with a, a boiled egg, mm-hmm. um, bacon, onions, tomato. Just chopped up a bunch of stuff, threw it into a salad. It's uh, a talented family. His cousin is uh, Jeff Chef. <laughs> who, in, who created the chef salad. Yeah. And his, and his Italian <laughs> cousin, Luigi Antipasto. <laughs> And their 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 uncle, is, of course, Little Caesar. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> uh, our the legitimacy of this show just dropped seven points. <laughs> just it it was already down to a uh, three. <laughs> <laughs> We're at negative four now. Yeah. Uh, let's see. And eventually, Walt, the, the puppet <laughs> Waldorf came up. <laughs> He's like, oh, oh I'm going to show you something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we, need them as, we need them as the new Asher to come on and <laughs> have little comments. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, great. <laughs> Are you done? No. Okay. No. Uh, oh, him. Uh, me, I don't know. Him. <laughs> we'll I have more out. things to say. <laughs> there is potential that Bob's head chef, Paul Posty, invented the salad. He could have just said, hey, you, chef, put a bunch of crap in a bowl. Sid Grauman needs dinner. Oh, uh, let's see. So the classic. And there's also Paul Small who came up with the side salad. <laughs> uh, yep. That was a deep sigh. <laughs> yeah. I deserve it. It's fine. Uh, let's see. I'm still so working the- on fruit salad and n- n- qu- n- qu- <laughs> or whatever it's called. Yeah, I don't think out. I'm going to get there. Tuna salad, this was. <laughs> Um, let's see. So the classic salad was greens chopped with tomato, bacon, chicken breast, hard boiled egg, avocado, chives, blue cheese, French dressing. It's Damn, my I think favorite you were salad. Of, I think you were thinking of Gill Garden. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you, Eric, you said that Cobb is one your favorite salad. And a couple of small tomatoes. And there's Wally Wedge, of course. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, Eric, did you say that Cobb is your favorite salad? Cobb is my favorite salad. Oh. It's usually overbalanced. There's usually too much meat and cheese. I want more salad in there. Uh, let's see. It's also possible that Robert Kreis, executive chef, created the salad in 1929. So a little bit of controversy about the salad. This location was also, as uh, we mentioned before in my sound, the origination of the Shirley Temple non-alcoholic drink. Shirley Temple Black did not like the use of her name to make a saccharine sweet treat. Uh, It's ginger ale and grenadine with a maraschino cherry garnish. She uh, did not appreciate that. And apparently, like, if you listen to that NPR the the clip that I got is from an NPR interview with her in the 80s, and she goes on to talk about how everywhere she goes, they try to serve her this drink, and it's too sweet everywhere she goes, and she hates it. I love that there's a link to Shirley Temple in both of our restaurants. Yes, it's great. 
Uh, there's also a legend of George Burns venturing through a snowstorm armed with cigars. <laughs> As the as the menu once had on a little cartoon. Uh, so George Burns went through a snowstorm in L.A. to get a hamburger on rye for his wife, Gracie. Who was hankering it doesn't for snow a hamburger. in L.A. It did in whatever year that was. This location closed April 3rd, 1985. The Arbot Continental Restaurant moved in, but it suffered a fire in 1987. It was left unoccupied, the building, and was home to squatters and teenage druggists for many years. Their niece was a very big fan of another salad that they made. There, I'm sorry. Uh, Stun lock over. You did it. Uh, the 1994 North <laughs> North Ridge earthquake destroyed the building, left it in ruins, and it became, quote, the first building in Hollywood to be demolished. It People wanted to preserve it, but it was not worth preserving. It was an empty building that a lot of people did drugs in, and um, there you go. It's the first ever building to be demolished in Los Angeles. Uh, that's what they like. these articles <laughs> said. They, like, no, oh, nobody ever demolished a building in Hollywood before. Uh, there are multiple other Brown Derby locations around hey, L.A. There's drugs in here. We can't have that. In this, L.A.? This, this is Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> 3625 Stocker Avenue and 4500 Los Feliz Boulevard. The Los Feliz uh, location was featured in the movie Swingers. It was a big time... Uh, big band revival place in the 90s. If you remember Cherry Poppin' Daddies and Big Bad Voodoo Daddy, oh, this was where to. the swing scene was revived at the Brown Derby. It was called the Brown Derby at the time? It was the Brown Derby at the time. Featured in the film Swingers, which is not about couples hooking up. No. As I was is it? told when by the way, fans of Boondock Saints, you would probably also love Swingers. Fair. <laughs> I haven't seen Swingers in a long time. Well, let's yeah. go watch Swingers. Let's put that on Scraping the Vault. Turn off the podcast. <laughs> go watch Swingers. Uh, let's see. So the final, let's see. Oh, no, I already talked about the closure. Uh, in 1987, the Brown Derby opened up for licensure. They wanted to license out uh, other other restaurants. So Walt Disney World licensed the restaurant for the Disney MGM Studios that opened in 1989. In 1990, they all, Disney also licensed the Brown Derby for Euro Disney, hmm. Tokyo Disney Sea, and Disney California Adventure Park. What? This obviously Whoa. did not open, but they held a license to open a Brown Derby in DCA. Uh, the Brown Derby also licensed out to MGM Grand Las Vegas in Nevada and MGM Grand Detroit. They still have a website that you can go to where you can buy caricatures of or replications of the caricatures, as we mentioned before. That is the history of the Brown Derby. All right. Very cool. I agree. It exists. And <laughs> I <things> agree. <laughs> Jimmy, tell me about the history of Carthay Circle, and you're only allowed to mention Snow White two times. Okay. A um, little editing here. <laughs> 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 okay. The Carthay Circle Theater was one of the most famous Wait, movie it's not palaces. a restaurant? It's a theater first. Oh, huh. Uh, and <laughs> Perkle Circle. <laughs> anyway, the Carthay Circle Theater was one of the most famous movie places in Hollywood's golden age. It's located on San Vicente Boulevard in Los Angeles. It opened 1926 and was demolished. By the way, not the first building to be demolished. It was demolished in 1969. <laughs> Your Thanks entire lot, argument internet. has been stricken from the record. <laughs> the auditorium itself was shaped in the form of a perfect circle. Not just a clever name. Uh, it extended vertically into a cylinder, set inside a square that <gasps> fleshed out the remainder of the building. It seated 1,150, 
Initially developed by Fox, it was called the Fox Carthay Circle Theater for its unique floor plan. It opened uh, at 6316 San Vicente Boulevard on May 18th, 1926, with a showing of The Volga Boatman, and was considered developer J. Harvey McCarthy's most successful monument. More on him later. A stroke of shrewd thinking that made a famous name of the newly developed Carthay Center, which is a neighborhood in Los Angeles, McCarthy's development was called Carthay Center, an anglicized version of his last name. McCarthy Carthay. McCarthy Carthay. Mm. Like any, cop. Any relation sounds to like, Paul McCartney? Sounds like somebody's no? a draft okay. dodger. Andrew McCarthy Famous actor of mannequin fame, his great nephew. Prove me wrong. The Carthay Circle Theater became the focal point of Carthay Center, and Carthay Circle became the neighborhood's official name. The whole neighborhood was named Carthay Circle after this McCarthy anglicized Carthay. Anyway, it's dumb. Um, The exterior design was in the Spanish colonial revival style with whitewashed concrete trimmed in blue with a high bell tower and neon sign visible for miles. The architects were Carlton Winslow and Dwight Gibbs. The iconic octagonal tower was placed in the front corner spandrel space left between the circle and the square. The auditorium cylinder-shaped wall was raised above the roof line to create a parapet visible from the outside that resembled a circus tent. Simple, massive, and dignified, the building stands out for its intrinsic beauty, raved the architect and engineer, which is a magazine. Anyway, they marked it as a, um, uh, they masked as a cathedral, is what the architect wrote. Uh, There was a drop curtain that featured an homage to pioneer Donner Party that perished crossing the Sierra Nevada (laughs) Mountains. Famously Uh, eating each other. That's right. Bronze, just wait till we get to the restaurant. Are they suggesting that if the movie's boring, that you just eat each other? That's right. That's what the drop curtain featured. Uh, bronze busts of Native American leaders and photographs of Edwin Booth, Herbert B. Beer Bohm Tree, mm-hmm. Sarah Bernhardt, Eleanor Dews, Ellen Terry, Lily Langtree, and other 19th century actors that you've never heard of adorn the lounges and lobbies. Do you, Mules- think, do you think that Dopey would be the one that would eat the rest? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> He's the wild card, definitely. <laughs> well, That's I think right. Doc would know like how to cut into the bodies. Correct. Uh, maybe they, they have an alliance. Right. And then Sneezy would sneeze out chunks. Sneezy would, yeah, he would. And then well, Dopey be, would just eat the pieces off people that Sneezy sneezed on. I think Sneezy mm. would probably sniff out the the bodies that like weren't good for eating. It would be it would definitely be Dopey's idea. Like he'd start okay. gnawing on, on an arm. And like, kind of, like, kind of whimsically, and they'd be like, "Oh, wait, I think Dopey's onto something." Who's who's first to go? Grumpy. They're, t- they're oh, sick of his. Naturally. Oh, nobody wants to be around Grumpy. Sick of his crap. <laughs> That's right. Uh, finally, there are murals of historic scenes that are forty feet tall that grace the walls, painted by Pasadena artist Allison Clark. There were some premieres at this theater. Do you want to hear what some of them were? Uh, I think we're gonna. <laughs> okay, uh, just I'm going to paraphrase a few. Uh, the Life of Emile Zola in 1937, Romeo and Juliet, 1936, Walt Disney's first animated feature length film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, in 1937. <gasps> Never heard of it. Dwarfs. Is it any good? That's Dwarfs. one. By the way, War Dwarfs. Dwarfs, you're correct, who sadly, famously, were not allowed into the theater because mm. it was the 1930s. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was an homage to the next film that premiered there, Gone with the Wind, in 1939. Where the uh, among many were other, allowed into the theater. <laughs> that they weren't allowed. It was the 30s. Uh, also, Disney's Fantasia premiered at the Carthay Circle Theater in 1940. Right, come on, Walt. You can't find somewhere else. Come on. <laughs> well, I mean, think about the Fantasias these days. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> at the time, Fantasia required the most elaborate audio system in the use a uh, Fantasound, a pioneering stereophonic process, was installed at the theater. Um, Marie Antoinette, uh, Palace of Versailles, The Great Zigfield, Good Earth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Oh, those are movies. Um, okay. 
<laughs> yeah, these like, are all movies. What? Sorry, how do, these, how do these connect? These this sounds really dark. But some, all of these <laughs> premieres were red carpeted events with the stars of the motion picture arriving in limousines at the entrance to covered walkway to the theater from South Vicente, cheered by hundreds of fans and bleachers, accompanied by searchlights scanning the sky. Only Grauman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood also had such elaborate premieres in that era. Hmm. Uh, in 1951, the first Patsy Award ceremony was held at the Carthay Circle. I bring this up because it was presented by American Humane Society, and the event was hosted by none other than Mr. Ronald Reagan. Oh. And it honored Francis the Talking Mule as the first recipient of the award that honored animal actors. <sighs> That's a fitting <sighs> thing for uh, Ronald Reagan to adopt. I think so. Um Although the Carthay Circle Theater had hosted the first-run roadshow, quote-unquote, reserved seat engagements of a great many aesthetically and economically important films, by the 1960s, the roadshow concept had indeed the Carthay Circle itself was considered an anachronism overshadowed by modern multi-screen cinemas. So long story short, theater was demolished in 1969 by its owner, who was the Naffy Corporation which erected its headquarters and main computer operations center in its place. Today, two low-rise office buildings and a city park operate on its former site. And do they also still not serve food? That's correct. Okay. Now, the people who live in the office or work in the office buildings might have food there. Uh, There were some replicas of the uh, Carthay Circle Theater. Would you like to hear where they are? Sure. Sure. In July 1994, a smaller scale pastiche of the facade of the theater, primarily the octagonal tower, was opened as, wait for it, we just talked about it before. MGM Studios. Once upon a time, (laughs) a gift shop on Sunset Boulevard section of Disney's Hollywood Studios at Walt Disney World Resort. The store now sells clothing items for men and women. Oh, that's kind of nice of them. Two. In (laughs) June 2012, a fanciful larger scale replica of the theater building was opened in the Buena Vista Street section of Disney's California Adventure Park. Uh, Although this replica is larger than the Orlando version, it's still slightly smaller than the 1926 original theater and has a modified exterior footprint with interior floor plan. While there is no actual theater inside, the building houses the Carthay Circle Lounge Mm. and the members only Club 1901. Are you saying floor. that you can't have, you can't watch a movie with a thousand of your friends? That's correct. Hmm. And you can't even eat with a thousand of your friends because the restaurant doesn't have that kind of capacity. Um, the Carthay Circle restaurant on the second floor, the original's signature circular floor plan is absent from the replica building and the circular parapet is squared off from the outside. I'm going to ask a really dumb question. And you might have already said this while I was thinking the, uh, thinking about other things. Did it open with the park? It Well, it depends on your, um, it depends on your opinion of when the park actually opened. Okay. <laughs> got it. If you're thinking of the original iteration in 2001, no, if you're thinking of how it is today in the real version, yes. Okay. No, I was just I'm racking my memory trying to think like, what was Because that's there? vaguely where like the sun, the sun, the sundial was. thing right. blinded the, everyone on the, the way blind. in. <laughs> <laughs> the wig sphere. <laughs> and then we're going to have this. Uh, our monument is going to blind everybody. Yeah, that's California. That sounds good. Yep. But it'll move to blind you wherever you go. <laughs> Such a fascinating thing. As the okay, sun moves, I'm sorry. so too. <laughs> that, will that's the sun something dial. that we need to have in our next, like, <sighs> bad thing that is gone. Yeah. 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 Cause I want to anyway, that more is about that. the history of the Carthay circle theater. All right. Uh, I agree with the history that has existed and that you said. Um, uh, let's see. I have questions that relate to the Disney Parks versions of these places. Do you want me to ask them now or when we get into the Disney Parks versions? You're the judge. Go for it. Whatever you want. Okay. Uh, so, Eric, do you feel that the Brown Derby having multiple locations – including one inside Hollywood studios makes it perhaps less special. I don't think so because the Brown Derby is this legendary LA landmark that is gone from LA. 
Okay. And okay. when you when it comes to like that classic feel, mm-hmm. as we'll get to in the actual restaurant, not only did they take basically the 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 layout of the Vine Street location, they also incorporated a lot of the decorations from there, and they have some original art from that location as well. Okay. So it's not like it ba- basically the brown derby is gone. The only places that have brown derbies are are knockoffs in Vegas and and Florida. Okay. So, uh, is so there still it, one in Vegas? I don't know. I don't think so. I didn't I didn't look that much into it, but I yeah, I don't know what's at MGM. Uh Paris still has a brown derby. I don't know Does what it? Tokyo. So it sounds like it? in some ways having it there makes it more LA than LA in that Let me one see. specific way. I don't think so. Paris. Oh, I got so many tabs open. Disney. It's in the Studios Park, the crappy one. Ah, that's right. It's in that covered Main Street building. That's like a and it's not a like a full. It's yeah, it's not a full restaurant. It's just like, hey, look, it's a Hollywood thing. Mm, okay. Okay. Uh, Jimmy, you can save this one for later if you have it in your notes. I'm curious how we go from theater to restaurant, and is that a good move? Um, the the how part I don't have, but I think that the takeaway I have initially is that the Brown Derby restaurant is an iconic Hollywood restaurant. Mm-hmm. And when you put it into a Hollywood themed area of the studio park, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a Hollywood park. um, It's more iconic because people know of the Brown Derby restaurant. I think the Carthay Circle Theater, which, I mean, if they're going to build a theater in the park, they should have done that. But having it a restaurant, I think largely... The, p- the people who care about Carthay Circle are specifically Disney fans. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because I think an average person would have heard of Brown Derby as a Hollywood icon. I don't think an average person would have thought of the Carthay Circle theater or otherwise, mm-hmm. except for how it relates to Disney with uh, on, Snow White. Honestly, that's kind of my sticking – one of my sticking points with Carthay Circle, which I I like it. It's fine. Um and I'm just throwing this out there as Jimmy, something for you to either address or Eric, you can use it as ammunition or both. Um, I, I, it feels your average person who doesn't care about Disney and just wants to go to the parks for the day. It, it feels like a cheap move to, to be like, yeah, it's the Carthay Circle. The what? You know, the place where Snow White w- premiered. Oh, I don't really care. <laughs> and I think that's kind of the point in, in this iteration of the of the the park. This mm-hmm. is sort of Walt Disney's 1923, 1928, whatever showing up in right, Hollywood. Right. And the significance of the Carthay Thir- Circle Theater with Snow White specifically. I think that's the point of this. And you're right, nobody would care, but that is I think that's 100% the conversation, Dan. Oh, Carthay Circle. What's that? It's the place Snow White premiered. Oh, okay. Or I don't care. But you bring up a good point, which is, I, I mean, you you made me think of a good point by what you brought up, which is because they did kind of graft on that very thin. See, see it works, but it's a very thin theme that they grafted on to that area. Of it's like, hey, it's it's uh, the Hollywood, the Walt Disney, you know, started his career in suitcase and a dream. Right. I guess it does. Terrible song. Oh God, yeah. I please, guess it. Please I no. guess it does make some kind of sense to then have it be Carthay. It's not a theater, but it's a restaurant. And for all we know, the theater had a restaurant, but it didn't actually. But don't tell anyone. Um, and I think it, it also does that Walt Disney World sequential imagineering thing, where like. You know, you where you you end you end that land with Carthay because that that's like the culmination, yeah, or the turning. I mean, point it kind of, of we'll get into it later, but it is in fact sort of now that you can't see the grizzly bear, mm-hmm. it kind of is the weenie. Yeah, yeah. I take that, a picture I mean, in front of it every of time the, I go. Yeah. It's, it's, it is the central hub 
of the park, if you can call it that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I got where I needed to get with that. Uh, Eric, can we get caricatures of characters at the Brown Derby in Hollywood Ooh, Studios? Great question. Uh, no, but you can order them directly from HollywoodBrownDerby.com. Caricatures of Disney characters? Oh, of Disney characters? No, uh-huh. no, no. No, okay. it's, it's all the classic folks. It's... Do you want me to list some of the people? No, no, God, no. We, <laughs> they're all they're all very old people that we don't know, like Burt Reynolds, and Bob Hope, <laughs> who, and Buddy Ebsen, Terry uh, Grant, and Clark Gable. I'm just Edgar Bergen, where he's got a caricature with two of his uh, his puppets. Ooh. Um, Actually, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and give Brown Derby a point for not selling caricatures of Disney characters because they could have done it and they didn't. And I appreciate that. Saccharine, sweet, icky, those are the ones. (laughs) That's the ones. Uh, Next up we have uh, similarities and inspirations in the restaurant paying homage to the original Eric go. Oh my goodness. Well, uh, basically, it's the same layout as the restaurant on 1628 Vine Street. The caricatures, as I've mentioned, are everywhere. You won't recognize most of these folks. Every time I sit there, I go, uh, that mine might be Cary Grant. So it, it's not know. just it's not all of those weird Disney adjacent uh, celebrities that we kind of make fun of, like Whoop, Whoop, Whoop. Whoopi Goldberg and Don Knotts and like, yeah, well, Don Knotts would be great, but like Josh Gad, Josh Gad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. These are, these are, 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 are replicas of the original art uh, from, uh, from both Jack Lane and Nicholas Volpe, depending on where you're sitting. Okay. Yeah. So these are, these are replicas of old, old ink drawings of celebrities that uh, we would not recognize as celebrities anymore because we don't know what they were from. So grandpa, take your grandpa. He'll point them out to you. Um, <laughs> take grandma and she'll say, ah, he had a real flame going for Can- Candace Bergen. Not Candace. <laughs> Bergen. She's too recent. Yeah. She's too young. <laughs> yeah. She's, t- she's much too young. Why did I think of Candace Ber- oh, Edgar Bergen was Candace Bergen's uh, grandfather. Right. Uh, <laughs> that's why I was the, the guy with the puppets. Um, um, so it sounds like it's kind of just it, it, the connection is that it's a replica of, of the thing. Uh, yeah, it's it's a replica of of the restaurant. Uh, the booths are dark wood. They point to times when Clark Gable might have been sitting at the booth and would have gotten a call from an executive and they would have brought a phone over to his table. Can you get a call with a phone at the table and not I, your cell phone? You know what? Maybe if you pay somebody, but I no, I haven't okay. seen that happen. Okay. Uh, but yeah, you walk in through the front entrance through some dark uh, wooded window double doors. You've walked down a nice little pathway underneath a a maroon colored uh, overhang uh, that reads the the Hollywood Brown Derby. It's a great place to sit and wait for your reservation. It's a great place to get out of the rain in Florida. Uh, as you walk inside, the check-in desk is to your right, and your server will escort you into the very large main room. Uh, the Brown Derby sign outside on top of the building is in the shape of a hat, much like the original uh, the Arby's? original restaurant, it is. it has neon. It looks great at night. Around the restaurant, there are brass derby hat sconces over a lot of the tables. The restaurant seats 424 people. I was unable to find how many people were able to sit in the Vine Street restaurant, but the current one has a capacity of 424 guests. Uh, let's see. There's a lounge outside that is a great location for uh, for basically the same menu. Like a lot of the lounges at Disney restaurants, you get the same menu of drinks and and food. It's it. You don't have to have a reservation. You can kind of walk up and get in. There are umbrellas protecting the tables. It's a great place to watch families walk around and break down in the hot Florida sun. There's a love plaque. That. <laughs> There's a plaque outside that reads, this building is inspired by the Vine Street Brown Derby originally built in California in 1928. 
the last inspection at the Hollywood Brown Derby in Hollywood Studios was December 9th, 2023. There were three violations. Employees were using a sponge to clean up lime juice instead of an approved cloth. Uh, the glass dishwasher was not working. The restaurant used the main dishwasher to wash the bar glasses. That seems weird. This Any sponge non- is unacceptable. We're going to build a prison. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, not- <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Uh, non-food contact surface, so a place that's just w- regular. It was the hand wash sink had a little bit of residue building up oh. in it. So probably like soap residue in the hand wash sink. Um, mm-hmm. Those were the th- three violations on December 9th in 2023. Um, the inspectors will be back in April of 2024. Oh, thank God. Um, so that's the actual restaurant. <laughs> Uh, okay. I'm assuming Carthay Circle is going to start racking up some points soon, but in the meantime, I'm going to do two points for actual authenticity. Uh, the authenticity. Those, that's the word. Those saccharine, sweet, icky drinks. Those are the ones. Because that's kind of cool. Sweet, it's a uh, icky drinks. Those are the ones. Yeah, that fits two points. Uh, We're up to four now. Okay. Yeah, because that, right. that that fits. It is an actual like replica of the thing. Whereas Carthay, I'm not anti it used to be a theater, not as much anymore, Uh, but it was, it's not a restaurant. So it's weird, but could be weird in good ways. So that's fine. (laughs) Uh, Jimmy, what are the things? I'm violating my own suggestions, but Eric, Uh do you have more about the restaurant? Are you onto menus? Oh, I've got menus and yeah. I just mean like I have, I have sort of a, a tour of the restaurant that covers homages it, but i don't want to step on you if you have more about the restaurant itself. i mean you've got different homages at yours mine it, the the main the main attraction is this looks very much like a restaurant that existed in hollywood during the gold, golden age of hollywood and it contains replicas of the very things that was part of the draw like you can sit in a booth where where Oh, I wish I could remember the reference where, I mean, where big time Hollywood stars wheeled and dealed, where they proposed to each other, where like everybody went to this restaurant. This was the big one of the Hollywood Brown Derbies. The other Brown Derbies were like, oh, it's just a different Brown Derby. And some of them gained notoriety later. Like I said, with the in the 90s, the Los Feliz became a place for ska and big band to come back and. This one was the classic one, and it 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 that's that's the draw. It feels like Hollywood glitz, and you're sitting there in your shorts and a t-shirt with your Mickey ears on, and you're eating a wagyu burger and charcuterie board in a place where it, decades, many a hundred years ago, people were sitting almost a hundred years ago. Oh gosh. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, more than holy no. crap! Nineteen twenty nine. Was it twenty eight wow. or twenty nine that this opened up? <laughs> a, a long time ago, very famous people sat down, and everybody showed up to just get a glimpse of their favorite people. This yeah. is that's the draw, and this is in the Hollywood Studios Park. It's in the Disney MGM Park. The idea was let's create the fanciest restaurant at this park to replicate. The fancy one of the fanciest restaurants in actual Hollywood, right? Okay. Uh, Jimmy Carthay. Yeah. So I already talked about the the it, the building's exterior is a replica of right. the Carthay Circle. How theater. direct of a replica is it? Just because I I don't know. It's just slightly smaller, okay. and the the only thing I could find is the circular parapet is squared off from the outside, but no, it, it look basically look looks like the theater. <clears throat> that's not exactly where the similarities end because there are homages in. So I'll, that's fine. I'm, not, a little I'm bit. not looking to penalize it for not being exactly. Well, yeah, one it for was one. a theater right. that's now a restaurant. Yeah, that's- and I mean, there's some give and take there. So I yeah. was just at, just out of curiosity. I'll, I'll look up a picture of the old one. Okay. Um, all right. So the the restaurant houses obviously a restaurant on the second floor, and then an alfresco dining on the main floor, and also 1901, which we will not talk about in this episode. Uh, the restaurant's an equivalent to, if you're thinking of Disney World, it's equivalent to what they call signature dining. 
uh, at Walt Disney World in terms of like atmosphere, menu, pricing, etc. There is, however, no dress code for this restaurant because it is in a theme park. So you, there is no dress code. Mm-hmm. Uh, reservations, obviously, you're going to need them. Unlike Disney World, you can only make these reservations 60 days in advance. Now, I point that out because recently, again, I'm reminded when I do a vacation package for a Disneylander, like I did for uh, um, our friend um, just recently, Mitchell. So Mitchell booked a package and I was like, let's do, he wants to do on a Friday, he wants to do um, Blue Bayou, right? This is, he's there for three nights. He wants to do Blue Bayou on the Friday night. I'm like, good luck. <laughs> and then he wants to do Oga's on a Saturday, something. And I'm going to get up at, you know, five in the morning to do all the reservations, but you can't do that. Even if you have a package, you can only do 60 days in advance. Package. By the way, got 6 p.m., uh, no, sorry, excuse me, 7 p.m. on Friday night at Blue Bayou. Also, another another uh, uh, frosted tip is I feel like it's better to – I already deleted Just, the song. Oh, that's fine. That's, ah. that's fine. We don't need it. It's, it's fine. Uh, uh, it, I think it's a better experience to Eric try to wait to for a the... Facebook messenger group while we're recording and just let it be known for the record. What? <laughs> Eric is replying to Facebook messenger groups. I, yeah, I'm not recording. bored. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> just interacting with our fans. Um, and friends. I have found that <clears throat> you end up getting a more immersive and more Star Wars-y experience if you kind of wait on the standby list for Ogas because if okay, you yeah. get a reservation, you're in a booth, which is like, oh, I mean, interesting. Yeah, you're there and more get, comfortable. Well, it's more comfortable, but like when you think of the star Wars cantina, you oh, don't totally standing around the bar. Yeah. You don't like, you, you're not thinking about the people that like are hanging out at the booth unless it's Han Solo and you don't get Good to point. shoot anyone. Greedo you know, shot right. first. Hmm. Yeah. Um, anyway, just a, an idea. Kind, kind of like, like Trader Sam's at Disneyland, where if you get the reservations, you're going to be inside, and that's great. But maybe you want to sit outside where it's nice and there's oh, sitting outside. Music wow. and Wonderful. It's, and it's so quiet and calm. Love I love it. Okay. Uh, the Carthay <laughs> Circle Restaurant also offers a World of Color dining package. Mm. Something oh, we haven't is, gotten to dining packages yet, okay? But you can. Oh, is there a dining, dining package? For, package. <laughs> Package. Am I saving this for later? Oh, there are multiple dining packages. Just continue. You're fine. <clears throat> <laughs> All right. Should I come back to it? <laughs> no, no. Continue. Yeah. Okay. Wait, uh, uh, Dan. Dan, what do you yeah. think? You're the uh, judge. Uh, uh, <laughs> ah, crap. <laughs> That's later. We're still talking about the place. All right. I'm highlighting that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Come back later. Okay. Uh, Carthay Circle Restaurant and Lounge is located in a lively central location off of Buena Vista Street and Hollywood Boulevard, serving a similar purpose to the central plaza at Disneyland Park. In a sense, it is the castle-like hub of Disney California Adventure. The weenie, later. perhaps? Yes. When you enter the front doors, you are placed back in time at a sophisticated lounge. The look of the two-story space draws on the dramatic interior styling of the original Carthay Circle Theater. By the way, I looked, dis- I looked it up, and it's yeah, it's not a direct one-to-one perfect rep- replica, but it's like it's close enough. It's good, right? Um, <clears throat> so the theater uh, homages, which feature designs inspired by Mission Revival, Art Deco, Baroque, and Western American art. Many of the design details in the Carthay Circle Lounge were inspired by the few interior photographs that Carthay Circle Theater still exists. So they did their best with images that they found Mm -hmm. to try to design the interior of the lobby in the lounge. Also, the designs of the lights and other fixtures are authentic and were manufactured by the same companies that produced the originals back in 1926. That's pretty cool. I think so. Uh, once you travel to the second floor, a star-studded hallway transports you into the main dining room area. The mural above the centerpiece, this is number two, by the way. Um, the mural above the centerpiece of the room is a replica of Snow White's Forbidden Forest. Sort of like Donna Party? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> <clears throat> Adjacent to the main dining room, there are three semi-private Wait, hold on. Areas. Wait a minute. Wait, that doesn't sit right with me. What? The mural replica of the Snow White's Forbidden Forest. It's a good mural. Yeah, I don't know okay, that it's in the fine. original building. It's fine. It's not it's in the original building. Snow White. It's, it premiered in the good. theater. It's good. It, it looks good. This. Okay, I'm just gonna. I'm acknowledging that this falls into the category of stuff that 
I I roll my eyes at, but it's it's oh, just fine. wait. It's fine. Oh no, I'm oh god. <laughs> uh, adjacent to the main dining room, there are three semi-private dining areas: the five-seat Hyperion and Buena Vista rooms, which are named, of course, for the streets on which two of Walt Disney Studios have been located, and the twelve-seat Premier Room, where wait for it, Snow White is also Jesus. paid homage to. Oh my god. In the premiere room, there's a chandelier dangling above the table. These crown-like features were designed to represent the evil queen's reign oh, over God. the castle. Okay, Brown Derby gets a point. <laughs> <laughs> Those saccharine, sweet, icky drinks. Those are the ones. Wait, an apple-shaped ap- <laughs> apple-leak pierces the center of the chandelier to represent the poison apple from the story. <laughs> Shirley Temple so, is there. How long? Shirley Temple's got a picture. <sighs> How long did that movie play at the Carthay Circle? Did the, the Carthay, Carthay Circle just become it's like a night. Snow White Theater? Yeah, it's, it's one it's night. It's the premiere. Yeah. It probably played there for a few oh, weeks. No. I don't know. Anyway. It's so dumb. Is it's there significant, significant, listen, homages to Fantasia? Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was a monumental achievement right. in filmmaking. Right. And that's it's a why, big deal. That's why Jeremy hates that, you know, has, you know, certain actresses in it of certain types. Uh, but that's... Um, do they have any homages to Fantasia? No. Okay. Um, not that I'm aware of. There are two solarium dining areas and For dining terraces. That, 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 well. that is the only spite point I'm allowing myself to give. But okay, that, thank you. That spite point is <clears throat> giant. That's you fine. Just, this is utterly I ridiculous. Get it. But here's the thing. We're trying to do Walt Disney's Hollywood. Right. Snow White was a big deal. It made the company. I mean, the seven dwarves are currently holding up the main headquarters. Well, yeah, that's fine. But this isn't the main foundation of this. This is a replica of the theater. The the connection is the connection. The connection is the history. This is like double dipping on connection here. It's just like, oh, remember that? Remember that? It's like, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. The the reason why we're allowing you to have a theater as like a big restaurant is because it makes sense for it to have a presence there and why not put a restaurant in there? But then to have it be like, Oh, here's, you know, a, a cup of dopey's jizz or whatever. It's just like, what? <laughs> it's, we don't need that. It's, well, I guess I'm not reading the menus. Then, huh? <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> uh, so there's solarium dining rooms as well. I, I didn't go through all the details of every photograph in the thing, but there are photographs of stars and producers from the 1930s all the way up to the two thousands all of them with Oscars in hand, including Walt Disney, of course. Right. And that's fine uh, for, 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 for what's worth. That, that's fine. Cause that's like, that's a tribute to the time. And, and I think that like, it does sort of serve in a way as like a museum for Walt Disney's time in Hollywood, but like enough with the snow white. Like, well, you, you're in luck. Okay. <laughs> Um, no, I take that back. Uh, okay. So <clears throat> there, the one in particular thing that I th- think is really interesting, this is just me as a kind of a musical slash Hollywood nerd. There's a photograph of um, Audrey Hepburn congratulating mm-hmm. Julie Andrews on winning her Oscar for Mary Poppins. Mm-hmm. The significance of that is that Julie Andrews played, she originated Eliza Doolittle on Broadway in My Fair Lady, right? But Hollywood didn't think that she was a big enough star. So they cast Audrey Hepburn as Eliza Doolittle instead of Julie Andrews. <gasps> they were nominated for Best Actress in the same year, Julie Andrews for Mary Poppins and Audrey Hepburn for Eliza Doolittle. Huh. Julie Andrews won the Oscar for Mary Poppins, kind of snubbing the My Fair Lady. So basically she said thank you to the guy who didn't cast her in My Fair Lady in her acceptance speech. Hmm. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, Rex Harrison, however, did win Best Actor for My Fair Lady that year. Uh, of course, there's the honorary Oscar. I haven't seen that movie. Uh, I haven't either. Uh, okay. But anyway, um, <clears throat> of course, there's a picture of Seven Dwarfs, you know, the special honorary Oscar, because it was such an incredible achievement. Yeah. Walt Disney and Shirley Temple with the honorary Seven Dwarfs Oscar. There's that picture. There's That's another great. little girl in a photograph. After you get off the elevator, it's not Shirley Temple. It is, um, her name is Margie Gay. She was one of the actresses that played Alice in the Alice comedies from 1925 to 1927. Hmm. 
Uh, that's a picture of her standing between Walt and Roy. So that is sort of the restaurant in general. Um, and all I have basically are the menus after that. All right. All right. Works for me. Um, yeah, I think I think tribute to Hollywood, tribute to Walt's time in Hollywood. That's great. And end it with the, with the Oscars and the seven tiny ones. That's 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 it. We get it. We get it. So high. I mean, okay. they say it so many times as you <laughs> as you're on the trolley, as you, as you as you walk in the doors. You're like, uh, hey, hey. By the way, did you know <laughs> this isn't just some random ass place that you've never heard of? This is right. where they premiered. <laughs> And again, not to not to try to discount my argument, but that's what I said a few minutes ago. Is that everyone knows? Oh, I, I, I presume everybody knows that the Brown Derby is a famous Hollywood restaurant, right? Right. But whereas not everybody knows Carthay Circle's significance, unless you're specifically the Disney connection with Snow White. Totally. But like by the time you get into the room with the Apple chandelier or whatever, like you, you have already, you already know what it is. That that's, that's my point is it's just like, I, okay, great, cool. Let's, <laughs> let's have like, let's have the experience be the experience now. But anyway, that I, I, I'm also aware that that is kind of uniquely, not uniquely, but I, I'm, I'm not everyone with that point of view. Um, and that's why only that one spite point, which, you know, maybe uh, you can get back. We'll see. So um, again, I don't want to usurp the show, but just as as we go along, mm-hmm. I think we've sort of the Brown Derby is a replica of the Brown Derby, so right. it's doing its thing. Carthay Circle Theater Restaurant pays homages to the theater, but it's a is a restaurant. Tribute. Yeah, it's a tribute to. It's a restaurant. <laughs> yeah, it's an upscale it's thing. Cool. It's a good nerdy thing. <clears throat> Actually, so I, I think moving. I, f- I thought of this. The Carthay Circle, the at the DCA, is sort of like. It's like the character in that his, in the historical fiction that like represents kind of yeah maybe there was a character that was kind of exactly lo- look, looked like that kind of but mainly it's like an amalgamation of the time period and several people and right. it, it, and that works I mean that's a it's a good way to I think Robert Downey Jr. was that character in Oppenheimer I think sure yeah yeah I don't yeah. know. You know, um, sort of an amalgam, yeah, yeah. Which is it's a it's a good way to do it. So I think moving forward, when we talk about the 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 actual restaurants, I don't know, Dan, how you want to go with this, but both of them are I would call signature dining. Is that fair, Eric? Yes, yeah, uh, it's definitely considered signature dining. At so Brown signature Derby. dining. Then I guess the question is, do I want and like you know a, a the layperson, the standard goer of the parks? Do I want to eat there? Can I afford to eat there? Do we go into that or just let it let it run its course? I mean, they're I th- both in the same category. Well, I think price points are certainly worth bringing up. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're going to be if you're going to be going to one of these places, then you already know what yeah. you're getting into. You're, you're you're doing the reservation sixty days in advance. You know you're going to do it, right? Right. Um, and, but there is this discrepancy, from what I understand, at Carthay. There's a, there's the lounge menu. Right. And there's the men- the regular restaurant menu and the availability of the regular restaurant is, I don't know if it's more limited than Brown Derby, but I know it's limited. I think they're only well, it's smaller. For dinner. Okay. Well, it's smaller, but I don't think they're open for lunch. They are. Oh, okay. Yeah. Brown um, Derby's got, uh, yeah, we've got stuff to talk about there. So yeah, right. why don't you go, uh, Eric, why don't you get into the, the menu? Let, let's not do a, just for me, maybe for the listener, let's not go into it every menu item like oh. as in what's in every menu item. don't worry like I'm, maybe, I'm, oh, I'm not part of yeah. the argument so you're not gonna get maybe that. we get high level on what's in the on the menu oh for sure <laughs> um but uh i need to pee great oh. so how about we is that take a drink a- or is that like a burger is that what's that i could get some water and pee myself there we go how about uh we take a quick <laughs> sponsor break <laughs> Your attention, please. (laughs) This episode is brought to you by LifeLock. The holidays mean more travel, more shopping, more time online, and more personal info in places that could expose you to identity theft. That's why LifeLock monitors millions of data points every second. If your identity is stolen, their U.S.-based restoration specialist will fix it, guaranteed or your money back. Get more holiday fun and less holiday worry with LifeLock. Save up to 40% your first year. Visit lifelock.com slash podcast. 
Terms apply. Ahoy, matey! How do you feel of taco? All right, we're back. All right. So now that we've described and talked about the history and the homages in the locations, let's talk about, do we want to do secret facts and the rest of decor? Do we kind of talk about that? I don't have that. All right, never mind. We're doing yeah, the menu. Let's talk extra. about menu. Menus. Now, how do you want to handle the menus, Dan? Um, do we want to talk about you know, like quantity, quality, price, all of the above? I think that's kind of, I mean, that's, that's subjective. So why don't we mm-hmm. talk about, uh, let's first, is there a way to hmm, talk about general variety? And then what's specifically on the menu? What are some price points? Maybe like what's the most expensive thing? What's a median and what's a low price? Uh, okay. Some maybe let's hit some appetizers, and and I think maybe um, also just talking about the just the numbers of like okay this has like a lot of things this one has these three things but they're really good I don't really know how to get there um, okay I think we'll find yep. it and uh, the, the the main thing that I'm focused on which I may or may not need to be is the difference in the lounge menu at Carthay. There is a difference. Ah, which is interesting because the lounge menu at the Brown Derby is currently the same as but the restaurant menu. Is that a good or a bad thing? So however when we want to get there, let's first talk about general price range. What are we looking at? Uh, if we want to get maybe not the most expensive thing on the menu, but your average price point for each okay. one. Uh, well, yeah. Brown Derby, if I'm just looking at what you have, if I'm going in, it's, uh, let's say it's just me, um, I'm getting, uh, yeah, I'm getting like a drink, maybe an appetizer, kind of mid range, but not, I'm not trying to go off, I'm not trying to go on the cheap, but I'm also not trying to break the bank. What, what can I expect? Okay. Well, you can expect, uh, let's see. Appetizers are going to be between fourteen and twenty three dollars. Okay. What and kind of appetizers you got? Give me, give me top top three. Oyster brie soup. Okay, uh, sounds good. Shrimp, shrimp cocktail. Sounds good. Uh, charcuterie board. That's the twenty three. That's the uh-huh. most expensive. Invented by shark, which is fantastic. I love that. Um, escargot. Uh, okay. That's snails. Okay. Um, there All are right. others. Uh, entrees. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, good. Mm-hmm. Good. Entrees. Go for it. Entrees. 33 to 49. Uh-huh. Uh, the notable exception is the Cobb salad, which is only $25. Ooh. If you want to add additional chicken or shrimp, remi- reminder that this comes with turkey, turkey right. and bacon. So right. you don't need more meat, but $25, pretty good. And it's a good chopped Cobb salad. I mean, it's, it's the, Cobb salad. But other than that, there's lamb shank, mm-hmm. uh, sustainable fish, filet mignon with bone marrow butter, and gar- mm-hmm. black garlic and mushroom risotto. I can attest. Very good. Okay. Uh, shepherd's pie. Oh. Yeah. I all mean, right. there's there's pork, there's halibut. And it, yeah, it, it all kind of falls into that range. The filet is obviously going to be toward the top, but Cobb salad twenty five dollars, I think, is pretty fantastic, and it's it's my favorite salad. Aside from anywhere. the Cobb salad, because it's iconic, right? Uh, if you were to tell somebody, like they're, they're like, okay, I want to go to the Brown Derby, but I don't really know what to eat. What what like two or three things should I absolutely consider? Because they do that especially well there filet filet. Okay. That filet, the risotto is amazing. It's, it's expensive as all hell. Like it's the most expensive thing on the menu. Right. It's $49, but I mean, a filet is a filet. Filet is great. 
and uh, that risotto is a great accompaniment. Uh, otherwise, I mean, like shepherd's pie, you don't see very often, and it it works really well. Shepherd's pie made actually with lamb, or do they are they sinful and make it with beef? Oh, um, that is a good question. I was just thinking the same thing. Let me. They do have the lamb shank, so maybe they just like carve off some bits of. <laughs> the shank. <laughs> All right, we got some leftover shank over here. Some of this fell um, off. Throw it in the bucket. Uh, where are the entrees? Shepherd's pie. And do they have a dining room themed to uh, blue cheese to represent that the cop salad was invented there? <laughs> no. Okay, good. Um, the, it, you know what's interesting? They don't actually say in the the listing what what shepherd's pie contains. Huh. Um, well, shepherd first. Yes, obviously. <laughs> Duh. Isn't there an apostrophe in there? It's not made of shepherd. It's oh, his pie. I've been making the it sh- wrong this whole the time. The shepherd made the pie. <laughs> oh, no. It's like a Sweeney Todd reference over here. <laughs> <laughs> shepherd's pie peppered with actual shepherd on top. Okay. Uh, so, but let's also not forget. I just It just occurred to me. This is generally fatty, creamy food, which is great. It goes with the environment. But. In Florida. <laughs> hey, it's heavily air conditioned in there, and you're going to spend two hours eating your meal. Just take your time. You can also get enhancements, 8 to uh-huh. $17. I mean, all of these entrees come with something. It's not like a, it's not like a, oh, what do you call it? Uh, when you have to order like the asparagus separate. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, um, uh, it's not a la carte. Right, a la carte. There we go. Uh, so you can get extra enhancements. You can get shrimp mac and cheese, spoon bread with lavender buddy, uh, buddy honey butter, <laughs> uh, which is fantastic. But you also get bread with your meal. Hi, I'm lavender buddy. <laughs> lavender <up>? buddy. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> uh, uh, have you met my friend seared Brussels sprouts with pancetta, not bacon? <laughs> Um, uh, rendered pancetta way better, way better than bacon. Uh, so enhancements, eight to seventeen dollars. Desserts, grapefruit cake is the iconic one from the restaurant. That sounds like something an old lady would make, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Well, would you like to hear the story of grapefruit cake? <laughs> of course, sure. there's a story. Luella Parsons was a Luella uh, <laughs> was a Hearst. Yes. A, a Hearst Media gossip Luella columnist. Parsons project. <laughs> Different Parsons. Luella uh, Parsons was a Hearst gossip columnist who complained to the o- owner, Robert Cobb, Bob Cobb, about his dessert selections because they were all too fattening. Mm. So Cobb went to his chef, to, chef and said, do something with grapefruit because everybody knows grapefruit is slimming. There we <laughs> so, go. He created the grapefruit cake, which has multiple layers. In between each layer is grapefruit infused uh, cream cheese. (laughs) (laughs) That's delightful. Oh, but the cake is so fantastic. Uh, There are a few other things poached pears uh, and panna cotta, uh, chocolate cake, creme brulee. All of these desserts are about $14. Um, usually on the menu, there is an option to have like small samples of each different type of dessert. Oh. Um, and they don't have it on the website, but every single time I've been there, it's on the paper menu. Like pick from these seven different desserts and get like four of them. Huh. Um, yeah. Always, always a good choice because then you get your little taste of each one of them. Uh, that works out well. Kids. Asher, listen up. <laughs> Appetizers, chicken noodle soup and chopped or chopped salad, three twenty five each. That's a steal. Grilled meats, seventeen fifty for chicken breast, seasonal fish or beef fillet. Not not filet mignon, beef fillet. You can get a hot dog for nine dollars. You can get macaroni and cheese for eleven fifty. Add in sides like potatoes, sweet potatoes, potato chips, potato fruit, potato parfait. There's a lot of potatoes in there. So um, kind of stuff that kids would immediately be drawn to. Yeah. And that's just an add on to any of the things. Okay. Uh, dinner menu, the same as the lunch menu. So here's drinks. 
Uh, for $9.25, you can get a press pot of Peru Alto Mayo Forest Coffee roasted by Joffrey's. It's a sustainable growing practice. They they specifically went to this particular place to get their coffee. And that press pot is good for like two people. Uh, mm. You can share your coffee. Uh, they've got expensive wines. They've got cheap wines. You can Hold get on, a dessert wait. wine flight. Go ahead. It's kind of dinery. That's kind of Hollywood old dinery. The coffee, the press pot. Yeah. So that you know, on top of the other stuff and hmm, I know Brown Derby is racking up points and I feel kind of bad, but <laughs> for some reason that shared pot of coffee just like really hits that like old Hollywood thing for me. I kind of, I kind of get it. And we, we always get one like it's, it's really good coffee. Yeah, and let's go to yeah. point for that. Oh. Carthay, I'm, I'm, I'm working for you. Sweet, icky drinks. Those are the ones. Uh, speaking of uh, sweet, icky drinks, there's a dessert wine flight. We can get some ice wine and some other things. I, I like ice wine. I, there's nothing against it. But cocktails are the main drag here at uh, at the, at the not the Carthay. We're at the other one. We're at mm-hmm. the Brown Derby. About 16 bucks for most of the cocktails. They have coffee cocktails. They have the classic grapefruit cake martini, which has a rim of like graham cracker crust. It's my wife's favorite. It's it's pretty good. And it is another original from the Brown Derby based on the cake. And uh, there's plenty more on the menu. It changes all the time. They have old fashions. They have new fashions. They have martinis. Uh, there's a pretty extensive, it, like this is the cocktail place at Hollywood Studios, right? Both at the lounge and in the restaurant. This is where you go. You can get beer. Like my favorite meal when I go is the filet mignon with a La Fine du Monde, which is a, a Canadian beer that is phenomenal. It it means end of the world. The end and of the world. What it feels like when you drink it. <laughs> oh, it's so good. It's so good. I think it's um, probably safe to say that, that in terms of like getting old timey cocktails, both of these look, both of these places are the place to go in these. Parts. Oh, I yeah. think you're right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's their thing. They both want to do old timey cocktails and they both do really great jobs of it. Um, I've got, do we want to do old, old menus? Now oh, yeah. let's, let's let's definitely get there, but let's wait to hear about Carthay. Let's let Jimmy talk. I, I do have another <laughs> question about Brown Derby. Do they have any sort of special ice arrangements? Because that's going to come up for Carthay. Special ice. Um, oh, you're talking about like the ice sphere in the the Manhattan, right? The Rye Manhattan that they do. Um, I have had like cube ice. Like so crystal <laughs> clear cube ice Oops, in sorry. some drinks before, like the old fashioned. But they don't have um, like wacky special ice that like you have to wonder how, what insane OCD person came up with it. Um, I mean, a crystal clear cube of ice is like a big one. Like we're talking like inch and a half, two inches on a, on all sides. That's well, pretty okay. cool okay. for an old fashioned. Okay. They also have glow cubes, which are not ice oh, at all. Everyone has glow, cube. glow <laughs> Everybody's cube. Everybody's got a glow cube. Uh, okay. So you barely got across the, I, I love the circle ice. I think it's cool, but that's, as long as you got wacky ice, that's, that's, we're covered there. Yeah. You um, know how, yeah. Disney's into the, the weird ice. They, right. they like it. And Jimmy, bless you. Uh, Thank you. What? <laughs> Uh, what do you got? Menu-wise? For the record, right. Jimmy so here's, sneezed. Here's where off I'm torn. Um, the the cocktail thing we'll get into. I, I didn't 100 percent spend a lot of time with it. There were a couple of things that stand out when we're talking about cocktails, but I feel like these well, two are kind of. It, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, but they're probably about even. Yeah, roughly. I mean, I think the names of things may be unique or whatever. Like for example, at at um, Carthay, there is a there is a cocktail called the Derby. Mm-hmm. Which has grapefruit liqueur. Oh, so okay. Kind of homage to that. There's obviously Shirley it. Temple oh. and whatnot. But so what I'm torn by um, is there are two menus, right? And you can't order one from the other. So there right. are two distinctly different restaurants inside the one place. By the way, not um, necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. So I'm just, that's why I'm kind of, I'm torn with my argument. But 
in the restaurant itself, there are only six entrees and there are eight appetizers. All right, what do you got? You've you've got some table sides, that kind of thing. The price is significantly higher than the Brown Derby. Uh, appetizers range from uh, seventeen dollars to twenty six dollars. Okay. Uh, your your roasted globe artichoke is seventeen to your citrus marinated sustainable fish ceviche. Okay. Um, a, a lot more fresh and seafood, a lot less kind of sort of you know you're not getting meat pies and whatnot. Um, you've got a, a pierogi stroganoff, uh, mussels, base scallops, um, fried shrimp, um, a wedge salad, obviously invented by Wally Wedge. <laughs> um, entrees Wallace, are please show some respect. <laughs> entrees range from forty six to seventy. Oh my goodness! So yeah, chicken, you know, organic chicken, and uh, and then there's butternut squash and sage gnocchi. Those are forty six. You've got a slow braised Colorado lamb shank at forty eight. Uh, fish of the day at fifty. Thick cut pork chop at fifty two, and a New York steak at seventy. Uh, okay, does the steak dance for you? <laughs> does, well, your, does your taxes strip for seventy dollars? Seventy, I know, Do right? Even it's a char- Do people Old know what certified steak Angus is? New York? Do New they York wipe is my your favorite memory? cut, but <laughs> me too, actually. Do they wipe oh. your memory of all steaks before this one? That's right. <laughs> uh, it comes with fingerling potato hash, poblano chilies, roasted p- tomatillo, queso fresco. So it feels all sort of very fresh. Um, the dining room. There's some the share some for the table share mashed potatoes, dinner rolls, Brussels sprouts, etc. How many rolls? How many types of rolls? Uh, just the one type of warm cheddar Parker house rolls. Those are good rolls. Yeah, <laughs> with a chili pine nut romesco butter. Uh, and then you've got the alfresco dining. There are twelve items. No appetizers because these are sort of all sort. I, I don't want to call them. You know, they're not like the Spanish tapas kind of thing. It's you, you can eat. And they range from uh, $16 up to $26 from your lemongrass soup and Moroccan roasted chicken meatballs, um, Kafka potato, or excuse me, kofta potatoes. Kafka potatoes would be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an Indian curry kind of, you know, potatoes. <laughs> but uh, Vietnamese twice cooked beef lettuce wraps, an endive and arugula salad of pears. Those are lighter fare on the on the al fresco, mm-hmm. and then you can get the filet mignon beef skewers at twenty six dollars. Um, the desserts are a little bit different as well. The desserts on Al Fresco are an apple sorbet caramel sundae, a hazelnut crunch Mickey ice cream pop, of course, and then for dessert, an artisan selected cheese board, which we all love a good cheese board for dessert. At the main restaurant, desserts are a uh, warm winter pear cranberry crostata. This is current, obviously, and then a chocolate cheesecake and a seasonal sorbet. The kids' meals are identical. Those are the only things that are the same. All of the uh, the kids' meals are the same in both. There's a uh, basically pasta marinara, a cheese quesadilla, or a pineapple ginger glazed chicken skewers. Those are the same in both restaurants. But those pineapple are the only ginger items. Glazed. Children can't yeah. appreciate such flavors. I I, I actually <laughs> good. appreciate that they that they do that, and I I I feel like I might be kind of a snob with this because I. I think one one of the things that I appreciate that my parents did was they would always just be like, "No, you're eating this." Like, right? Yeah, <laughs> they would never. It would never be like, "But I want a hot dog." Like that wasn't even a possibility for me to be like, "Where's the macaroni and cheese?" Like I, of course, appreciated macaroni and cheese. Like any right. here is a chicken breast. You will eat this. Yeah, it's like no, you will try. You have to, the rule was always you have to try it. If you don't like yeah. it, fine. Uh, ah, yeah. Right. That's our rule too. Um, so, so the things that stand out, are the, the, the only things that are the same are the kids entrees. That's the, you know, everything else yeah. is different. So you've got a variety of 12 items for al fresco. And I'm know, having difficulty. Like I'm, I'm, I swear I'm not trying to make Brown Derby win this, I, but like, I'm trying to find some coherence within the menus and I'm just not seeing it other than it all feels very California cuisine. It, right. It, I think the theme is California, not so much the theater. When you get into the drinks, then they start kind of throwing in clever um, names like curtain call. Yeah. You know, that sort of thing. And then like in, uh, in Alfresco, they call it the classics 
And then the Golden Age, an ensemble cast, Curtain Call, Buena Vista Brews, yeah. and then the Bright Lights, which are wines, the Red Carpet or Red Wines, Matinee Features. The, the, all cocktails have special Yeah, you know, names. I got a bunch of those too. Let me but find But I think my the main menus. thing is if you want like an old timey, like weird ass cocktail. You're not getting that like, here. Well, you can get it. You can order it there, but you're not, it's not on the menu. Like they're not going to have a corpse reviver on the menu, but you could order. No, I'm talking about there. that. I went, I, when you said old timey, like a shepherd's pie and a cob salad, you're right, not getting right, that right. on this menu. And that uh. is actually, that is actually, I think that. Uh, Do you want me to, to, to damage your argument for me here? We've got we've got things like sidecar and whiskey sour, got but we've that. also got, got the it. Hollywood Manhattan Jewel of Hollywood. Uh, yeah, I mean that it's all the same. Absinthe minded peach tree punch, Florida Pim's Floridian punch. Collins. I, I, I guess my point is it's all the fashioned. same standard Disney drink menu that we've seen everywhere, yeah. but they generally hire the bartenders that can pull off like the they're really not, wacky stuff. Yeah, they're not doing the the. You could probably ask for a corpse reviver at both places, and right. somebody think, will make one for you. Well, I know at Carthay you could because my mom ordered one and it was great. Apparently, um, let's see. Uh, alcohol. So where I'm at with this is, I think I understand why. This isn't a negative, but it might sound like one. I think I understand why the Brown Derby has the menu it has. It's because it's a replica of the place that it is. However, in the Florida heat, you you might just like sweat grease the rest of the day. But whatever. You know what you're getting into. Um, Are you saying one half roasted chicken is too much for the average Floridian? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Uh, But I'm not saying that. And I think it's great. It's charming that they have that. And Carthay, I understand why they have the fancy ass, you know, I get that it's like it's fresh and the menu changes, I think, on a pretty regular basis. From what I understand, the soups are like really great, usually not the most filling thing in the world, but they're almost always good from what I've had. Um, But I just want at least a couple of those old, like old man, gross, too much cheese, like chicken a la King. Yeah. Oh, (laughs) give me a chicken a la King on that menu. It was on the menu. Oh my God. We were there in 2022. (laughs) (laughs) Not that long ago. (laughs) Yeah. But you know what I'm saying? Like, I think that like, I, I get that you're going in that direction, but you're also, an old timey location. So give me, a, they should, they should have a Cobb salad to be perfectly honest. Yeah. I'm actually surprised they don't. Yeah. Um, you know, there are homages obviously to Brown Derby we talked about, but I, I guess where I'm at with it is that neither of these restaurants require a dress code. So they're not snobby. Right. Um, one of the interesting things is that the, it was the, the Carthay Circle, when it opened, was the only restaurant to ever open with 93 certified wine sommeliers. But mm. I think that's a thing of the past. Huh. So if it wanted to be hoity-toity, the lounge al fresco thing kind of makes it a lot more user-friendly. Because while I, I don't know that I could afford a $70 New York steak, if I'm sitting on the patio, I'm outside, it's a nice California with the street atmosphere, mm-hmm. and I can get a nice Indian you know, curry-flavored th- potato and be fine, or right. filet beef skewers for $26. I can manage that. There's your two points for actually, let's say three for Carthay because so proud, I I first of all, it exists. Yeah. Second, the price point. And third, it's, it's, it's a really nice little spot in the park that if you haven't mm-hmm. taken time, it's, you know, it's sort of like what we've talked about with the lamplight. It's like from the outside and if you, or if you just think about it, if you try to conceptualize it, it doesn't sound like much. It doesn't sound like an experience just like, oh, I really you know, treasured those memories. But like every time I've just hung out at the Carthay Lounge with people, um, it's been just really – it's it's just it's a very nice hangout place. Yeah, it is. It is. It's very nice. Yes. So, and, and that where I was struggling with it is it's not the restaurant. Right. You know, 
Yeah. And and that's why it's hard to argue because Brown Derby is the restaurant. And if you're in the lounge, it's because you didn't make a reservation and it's the restaurant outside. The yeah. Lounge, yeah. The lounge is good. It's not as good as the Carthay Lounge. Um, it's, it's outdoors. It's easy to get into. You can just grab a drink and leave. You don't have to go into the lounge. You can get a cock, you can get a, a grapefruit martini and leave. Right. And, I, which I, I will say which you could do technically in the bar at Carthay can get a gar- grapefruit martini. Also. Yeah, yeah. At the Carthay yeah. lounge though, like every time I've kind of, I mean, just, just like how I want a giant, disgusting, you know, Cobb salad filled with cheese and eggs at the restaurant. I would, I kind of ex- would expect at least like a sampler menu of the restaurant stuff. So, the, some representation other than skewers, you know? Yeah. yeah. The yeah, lounge. No, good point. And there's nothing in the lounge that you can get in the restaurant. Right. And vice versa. Which is kind of cute, at- but let's have at least a tiny, a tiny rope bridge between the two, you know? Yeah, the the lounge at uh, Brown Derby. I will say they they do have smaller versions of some of the meals, and, and that's not re- like you. It's not on the the main site right now, but from what I've seen, every time you go to the restaurant, it's different than the the Walt Disney World you know website. It's the the dot go dot net dot biz yeah that you look at when you go there they've got a paper menu that usually has today's date on it and i always take a picture of my menus and i've had a smaller cob salad that's in this cool little cylinder with like paper around it and it's basically you kind of upend it into your bowl and you toss the salad yourself and there you go you've got the whole thing (laughs) great presentation (laughs) um all right. So should we, is there a, uh, just in the interest of time, is there a seasonal menu conversation, Eric? Uh, they change the menu often. How often? Quite. Are, are we know. talking like, like multiple times within a year? Oh yeah. Multiple times within a year. Okay. I've got pictures of menus because we go there every time we show up and there's always something different. There is a separate menu for, they've got a prefix menu for the phantasmic dining package. Yep. There is a talk about that. Uh, there, there's a new thing that they started doing this year during Jollywood Nights at Hollywood Studios, where when you show up during that night, there's a completely different menu. They have live jazz playing. Uh, there were some problems early on with Jollywood Nights, but apparently it kind of came around. Even Jeremy said that by the end of the year, Jollywood Nights was good and a good value. Wow. Um, and it's it's live musicians doing jazz Christmas songs. There's a completely different menu with yeah. classic cocktails, the Bee's Knees, a sidecar, martini I, flights, oyster Rockefeller. I that's mean, that, that's that's all cool, but that's be, that's behind the paywall, so I'm not going to include any of that. Oh. The, you know, okay. I, I'm just talking about the general experience. Well, yeah. You know? the, yeah, the general thing. They change the menu all the time. They always okay. have like a different fish. They always have a different right. That's I, true for both. Yeah, I, I would I would assume they they're, they're uh, constantly moving it around. So we've kind of talked about we've talked about menu generally. Let's get into dining packages. My biggest question is, can I get the World of Color dining package at the lounge in Carthay? Because I know how hard it is to get into the restaurant. <sighs> well, Dan, <laughs> the answer is no, but it's also no at at. Yeah, at the other at at Brown Derby, you don't get but it in the lounge. You have but to. The last the I restaurant. checked, the lunch, it's it's the, effectively the same seating. Lunch is thirty nine dollars. Dinner is fifty nine. So I you haven't can get seen the same. that place open for lunch ever. I'm not oh, saying wow. that it's not true. I just, um, it's true. Okay. Do you know? Do you know how much it is for the Fantasmic package for adults? It, lunch and dinner. How much? 77 Ooh. for Brown Derby. Kids, 31, nine and under. For the Fantasmic thing. Right, for Fantasmic. The far superior Fantasmic that has the no, uh, I'm taking my headphones Steamboat off. Willie. Go, Stop keep it. going. <laughs> Give me a sign when you're done. <laughs> um, we still have a, we st- we still have a, a, a dragon that breathes fire. Drink some water. 
<laughs> Dan's drink. Dan can't hear any of this. Um, so he can't refute it. All right, let's hear it. Let's hear what the slander you're talking about here. Um, uh, Dan, I apologize. Alfresco dining is open from 11 a.m. to 3.55 and dinner from 4 to 8. Mm-hmm. The restaurant is only open for dinner. Okay. Oh, yeah, because the alfresco is the outside yeah, I was patio thinking. stuff. Okay. Then I really, I really wanted this to be closer, and I'm so sorry, but Brown Derby gets a point for that. It's Just open more often. Sweet, icky drinks. Those are the ones. However, I do know that, uh, first of all, World of Color, um, just learn how to do a virtual queue. You do not need a dining package. Um, And also they offer one at Storyteller's Cafe Buffet Uh place and at Trattoria. Um, And I believe it's like they're doing that again. Okay. Six something ish. Um, Fun fact, I think, if I remember correctly, the price for the dining package at uh, Storytellers is roughly the same price as just having dinner there. So um, I like Storytellers a lot. I'm not, I, I, I've not had a great time at Trattoria. Trattoria is fine. Um, I got the steak there once. And in terms of like what you're expecting for a theme park steak, it's fine. It's not great. I wouldn't begrudge anyone who, you know, felt the Trattoria was a really good place, but it's, it's not. I mean, if you have a taste for like Olive Garden plus, then sure. That's fine. Go for it. Um, Do we want to talk about land impact or or are they kind of the same? uh, Should we do? I'd like to do the former. um, Oh, old menus. Do you, yeah. what, what, how is the oldest, how old is the oldest menu you have? Um, opening day. Ooh. Um, so. <laughs> sorry, I'm looking at uh, dining <laughs> packages. I apologize. Uh, okay, so we, y- you want to do yours 1999? Uh, yeah, I've got 1999. I also have a brown derby from, uh, the forties. Hmm. I think interest of time and me slowly, you know, needing to eat with every passing minute as we talk about food. Yeah. Um, maybe say we can save that for another time. I don't know when that would be, but, um, let's talk about opening day menus ish. Nice. Yeah, so you you open at eighty nine. You've got a menu from ninety nine. From yeah, I still don't have an day, Okay, so from ten years later, ten years after they open, where re- this is just mainly this is just you know as we love to do, we're demonstrating how uh, Joe Brandon has destroyed the economy. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so filet mignon, a thing that we still have on the menu, um, <laughs> that is forty nine dollars in the current day. What was a blackened filet mignon in 1999? Um, $23. $36. 1795 Damn. Ooh. Yeah. First of all, if you're eating a black blackened filet mignon, I hate to break it to you, but you don't like steak. Yeah, that's... Uh, how Agreed. about uh, in 1944, a <laughs> uh, breaded veal cutlet... <laughs> Wait, what? what? What's this? The old, the, the old from the world original, world original. restaurant. I'd say four fifty. Eight dollars. Two dollars. Ooh, <laughs> yeah. What a what a deal. Uh, grenadine of fillet beef, three twenty five. Oh my god. Yikes. There's a lot the of veal on this menu. <laughs> Holy crap. Well, it's so it's tender because it's. it's, it's, it's <laughs> Jimmy, what um, do you got? <laughs> all right, so so today. Dan, you can get a uh, Carthay wedge salad for eighteen dollars. That's today. In two thousand twelve, twelve years ago, you could not get a wedge salad, <laughs> but you could get a simple green salad for twelve dollars. Eleven dollars. The roasted beef salad was twelve dollars. <laughs> Roast beef salad. Something that I found interesting is the signature fried biscuits, which were available. As late as 2015, but are no longer on the menu. 
Huh. Huh. Carthay Signature Fried Biscuits is a starter. How much are those? Uh, $8. Eleven dollars. Oh Ooh, crap! I was going to get four. <laughs> yeah, eleven dollars. This is 2012. Um, a ginger pork satay. Okay. Uh, eleven dollars. <laughs> Sixteen. Okay. Um, I'm going to do a comparison today. You can get a citrus marinated sustainable fish ceviche for twenty six dollars. Jesus. In 2012, you could get. Not very a, sustainable for the budget. <laughs> Am I right? Yeah. In 2012, you could get a halibut ceviche, not sustainable, for how many dollars? 13. Close. 15. 15, Ooh. exactly. You won. Uh, finally, you can get the certified charred Angus New York for $70. In 2012, you could get the grilled Angus beef ribeye. Oh, now we're talking. 25. Uh, 42. Oh, Dan, I was so impressed. 41. Oh, <laughs> I knew 20. By the way, ribeye superior kind of stuff. Agreed. Too. You like ribeye yeah, over New York? Oh, it's a better yeah. flavor with all the marbling, but uh, I'm with you, Eric. If I'm going to a steakhouse, I usually order the strip. If it's bone in, like a T bone. Mm. Mm. Bone in. <laughs> Um, okay, that was a fun game. We did it. Yay. Um, the longest let's... episode we've ever done about two restaurants. <laughs> All right, Land Impact. Basically, Eric, talk me away from letting Carthay yeah, win this say. one. Uh, I mean, it's at the end of it's at the end of their Hollywood Boulevard. It it just feels a part of everything that's on the that side of the park you've you've got the the chinese theater you've got you've got the brown derby leading down a hollywood boulevard that has other replications of hollywood landmarks including the carthay theater it's i'm gonna be honest i i've been to disney world enough times Mm -hmm. uh that it counts and and I'm not just saying this because we're doing this episode. I don't think if you were to ask me where it is, it would be kind of I just kind of I think it's over there, and I could not describe it to you. Hmm. It doesn't. It has never stood out to me. Jimmy's putting together his. Uh, I'm, sustainable I'm grasping straw? at straws like Eric. <laughs> <laughs> This, Jimmy, this, like, this, this one's yours hey, to lose. I mean, you still could, but it's got um, the neon sign up there. Nobody's ever in that night, park after. But yeah, yeah, everybody leaves. Part after of the problem you. is there's yeah. a giant, there's a giant like train sign that blocks the restaurant, and it's off the beaten path. Like it's not on the road when you're walking down Hollywood Boulevard towards Tower of Terror. If they it's, still I mean, had the 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 cinnamon bun store on the side, you wouldn't be saying that. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw you I'm gonna throw a rope into this pit that you're in, and it's it it's a good rope, but you gotta you gotta do the work to, to made, get it out. Made out of silk. Yeah. <laughs> um. Is it possible that it's kind of not standing out as much could work? In a good way? Genuine question, but I, I'm i not saying it. it. I don't know how that, I don't know how your argument would be valid other than, hey, maybe because it doesn't stand out as much, my wife and I can go and get a martini at 11 a.m. Yeah. Uh, because people don't know that you can go get a martini there outdoors at 11 a.m. They're still, dad's still like, oh, where's, where's the slinky? Where's the slinky? <laughs> uh, I, I, I think where I'm kind of going with that is I could see a case being made for it sort of like being like, you know, just like Hollywood, things are kind of like iconic things are just next to each other. You, you got to know. You got to know what you're you, looking for. Yeah. And I think that I that know. that would work if there were more iconic things that weren't just like merchandise stores. And it, yeah, I mean, my argument back in the day, and we'll get back to this soon, I hope, maybe, 
is that all of the buildings on Hollywood Boulevard in Hollywood Studios are actual buildings and they're not flats. Um, right. But And they're all based off of actual Hollywood buildings that are iconic. This is another one. And sure, it's... It is set back and there are like planters in the way and other things. So yes, it's not completely. It's, it's not a weenie. It's not a weenie by any standard. It's something that you, you have to walk by and you're like, what is that? Oh, it's a cool restaurant. All right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. It's not as recognizable. I will admit that. But um, if you know, it's there, you want to go there. At least I do. I don't know. Carthay I mean, Circle, I can't remember the last time I ate, actually ate or drank at Carthay. Because <laughs> it was a right. pain to get into. And with me, when we didn't go to the Disney Junior dance party live on stage in 2023, <laughs> right. it was the last time you ate there. We sat on the patio and ate. <laughs> That's the last time. Did we? <laughs> Less than a year ago. Yeah. We ate al fresco, baby. Did we? I thought we did. I did. I, I, don't, I don't think I did. Carthay. I don't think I... I think I abandoned. Oh no! You. I take that back. I take that back. It was when we went. Uh, I had COVID <laughs> in 2022. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, fresco. At, that's at, the last. At, at Carthay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, fair. Jimmy Land Impact. I, I think, I think you're in a good place, but you got to earn it. Yeah, I mean, I'd already mentioned this is sort of the the central hub, you know, focal point when you walk in. It's at the end of the quote unquote Main Street. It's an iconic image if you know what you're looking at as far as Carthay Circle Theater goes but it is it's 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 the thing that you run into if you walk straight into the park and there are people inevitably dining on the street so you have that sort of feel of of um you know like who's who in Hollywood sitting on the on mm, the streets and yeah. you're kind of I don't know it, it just never it, it is the central way, focal yeah. point yeah, yeah it's it, the kinetic energy of the area. It's the, I mean, uh, this may may hurt my argument, but it's similar to me to Pinocchio Village House in Magic Kingdom. It's kind of the the central square of the land. I'm yeah. I mean, I I don't know why it would take away. It's not. I'm not like anti Disney World. Um, yeah, I, I, no. I, I, you bring up a good point with the the who's who sitting outside kind of thing. I never even thought of that, but that's good. Um, does people can sit outside at the uh, at the Brown Derby? You just can't yeah, see. Yeah, but him. no one would know. No one would know. They'd just be like, it's yeah, it is recessed. It's probably it's a down. star. It looks yeah. honestly. It looks like a place that people would. And I, I this is a memory, and it's a memory that I had legitimately that has like introduced itself into my brain. It looks like the kind of place that you would go while you're like on jury duty for lunch. Yeah, so that's what I was getting towards. Again, I don't have any like for real skin in this game, but to me, they're both meant to be representations of Hollywood icons. Right. Um, Carthay feels very fresh, and maybe it's because the age of the restaurant. I don't know. It feels very fresh. The food is fresh. The atmosphere is fresh. Um, sort of the the outdoor aesthetic. Brown Derby is just very depressing to me. It's it's dark. It's and maybe that's the intention, but it just kind of feels very dark and secluded and hidden. It feels more authentic to that that forties yeah, era, era where, yeah, which no, is, I agree. You're in a large room. There's it's noisy. It's noisy as hell in that restaurant. And is that a is that a bonus? Does it make you feel better about it? Maybe I don't know. Um, sitting outside, there's not enough seats outside in the lounge, but it is nice. You're covered by umbrellas for the most part. And if there is a rainstorm, which there there is, because you're at Walt Disney World, there's a rainstorm. Uh, you're protected. And people walk by and they're like, why are those people dry and having a martini? I think what it comes down to me in terms of land impact is that like, uh, by the way, Carthay, let's say uh, two points. Ah, oh, you're just making him the winner because no, he I'm not. wanted I'm, to. No, I'm not. I, I know where this is going. Um, I I think that uh, what was I saying? So Carthay, in terms of like land impact and presence, it has more of it. It has to argue its own. It has to argue for its own existence. 
across the board. Everyone knows what the Brown Derby is. It's iconic. Whether, I mean, everyone knows what the Brown Derby is. It's an iconic Hollywood place that no longer exists in Hollywood, which is kind of weird, but whatever. Um, so when you hear, oh, Brown Derby, that makes <laughs> when sense. When they opened it. <laughs> <laughs> right. But when you hear, okay, they have a Brown Derby there. I've heard of that. I know what that is. I definitely want to go to the Brown Derby. Um, if you've made those plans, then great. You know what the Brown Derby is. You know where to find it. You're excited to see it. Uh, but if you go to the park, it would be kind of like, oh, there's a Brown Derby there. <laughs> there's a Brown Derby. Oh, it's that? Uh, okay, whatever. Where Carthay... Well, unless you're someone who wants to be in a dining room, that's a tribute to Snow White. You don't really know the significance of it, but it does have a significance to the company. So they have to kind of make it, give it a reason to exist and almost make it feel more iconic than it actually is. And they've done a very good job at doing that where Brown Derby I feel like they kind of just said like, well, it's the Brown Derby. So people are going to know what that is, Um, which is not a bad move. It's just that Carthay had to do more and you notice it. Side note, Eric said at 11 o'clock on a whenever he can show up and go get a martini with his wife at the bar. Mm -hmm. Ain't no way in hell you're showing up at the Carthay at 11 o'clock getting a martini. (laughs) There's just no way you're going to be able to walk in there and get a drink. (laughs) That's true. Yeah, you've got to get on the – you can't go inside. You you have to get on the waiting list and do the the mobile – what is it? The mobile virtual queue. Oh. And at, at, at Brown Derby, you basically just walk up. Yeah, you might have to wait a little while to sit down, but you can just get a cocktail and leave. Wait a minute. At the lounge? At the lounge. Are there reservations Which, or can the lounge you just is outside? Up? Lounge is outside. They're like – 20 tables outside. Right. And do they um, offer reservations? Because no. that, okay. That's no, another show point up. for Brown Derby. Oh, Jimmy. Does thank you. Because that, that icky. helps with the idea just of left. you could just walk in at any time where Carthay people will, I mean, people who don't know any better are going to make a reservation for anything because they want to have that reservation. I, I don't blame them. I'm, I'm a reservation hoarder. I get it. But um, it's going to be harder to just find a stray open table at Carthay Lounge. Yeah, and the virtual think- queue is good at Carthay. I it, I think it works well, but it's still it's still hard to get. And right. I think it eliminates the-, the long line of people waiting outside. Yeah, but part of the part of the thing is it's California, and you know the the sort of the um virtues of having a California Disneyland audience. I think if Brown Derby is in California adventure, you have the same problem. Probably. That's you know what I mean? Probably like it's just true. A, because it's the place to be or whatever, but that lounge is so cool. The yeah. Carthay lounge is so cool it is inside great. and all the it is images it's, cool. and it's small. Like there's only so many seats. And so it's kind of become exclusive. But I think the last time that I just kind of walked in and got a cocktail was with you, Dan, eight years ago right. when I quote unquote interviewed Scott and his, his girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. We sat there. It was just like, that's the last time I think you could just walk in and get a drink. That's true. It's been a long time since I actually went into that lounge. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. I think I, I'm where I need to be. Do either of you have, any, have anything else to add? No. Do okay. you want to see a hand drawn picture of Humphrey Bogart at your restaurant? <laughs> Um, do you want to see? Uh, well, let's let's pick somebody more. Do you want to see Red Skelton or Peter Lawford at your restaurant? You realize that you're winning this currently, right? I know I'm winning, <laughs> but he's trying not to. But look at look at. I know he's he's trying to do that thing he sometimes does. <laughs> look at that! Look at that majestic profile of Robert Mitchum, the star <laughs> of Night of the Hunter, and the one of Jimmy Durante that's on two pages. <laughs> yeah. Um, Only a little racist. <laughs> uh, or nosist. Kind of. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay, I think that what, I, what I'm having difficulty with explaining here is how Brown Derby has eight points, Carthay has six, <laughs> and I still like Carthay, and that's the thing. Like, um, you, you can like the loser, it's fine. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean that's 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 what my mom always said to my dad, and you know we still <laughs> never never mind. <laughs> also, Carthay has real fancy bathrooms upstairs. Oh, we didn't get to bathrooms. Okay, oh, yeah, Carthay fancy bathrooms. Uh, Brown Derby. What do we got? Uh, we've got bathrooms on the main floor. They don't have full closure doors for the male pooper stalls. <laughs> Okay, point Which for Carthay. I know is one of the <laughs> <laughs> one of the main draws for uh, for Carthay, but uh, but we both have we both have um, Club Thirty Three style things in the same building. Yeah, uh, again, didn't want to get into that. No, yeah, that's not, we'll leave that's, that out because we've never been to either one. That's yeah. We don't need to. We don't need to get into that part of my personality. Uh, so uh, Carthay has better toilets, so it gets an extra point for that. Because uh, I'm so proud, I think I'll bust. <laughs> <laughs> Again, seriously, stop being dirty about that. Um, so Brown Derby has eight points. Carthay has seven points. Um, I think that's Brown all. Brown Derby I, wins. Yeah, Brown Derby <laughs> wins. I, I I really expected it to be more of a like neck and neck, but. That's pretty neck so and neck. If if you're thinking about it, I mean, like it, in the process, <clears throat> I expect it to be more like oh, 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 more of a constant cliffhanger. Carthay, I mean, so okay, Carthay, what they could change to get it to be that more of that, like oh, there, it's it's like a constant photo finish would be just get okay, we get that Snow White premiered there. Stop. Um, and I want more of that old timey food. Like, give me an old lady cake, you know, like not the whole menu, but just like a little sample. I mean, they, they've thought of clearly they thought of making a brown derby at California Adventure. Like, just ha- slide a little bit of that in there, you know, do, do, do you want to hear do you want to hear about the old old manist food that I've had at at the brown derby? Sure. It was uh, in 2022. I've got the I've got the menu picture from there. Uh, that was the filet mignon with Walt Disney's roast beef hash. So the roast beef hash had a fried egg on top of it. Yes, <laughs> I was really hoping <laughs> you'd say Walt's chili on top. That was the heaviest food I've ever had in Florida. I felt awful when I left, and it was the best. And honestly, it was so mi- good. If 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 anyone at Disney is listening to this show, as I'm sure they are, um, one way to like just juice up that that like old timey old man energy, have just all you got to do is add this one dish to the menu that never <laughs> leaves: steak tartare. Oh, steak tartare! Chicken ala yeah. king was a pretty was pretty good. But Chicken ala king is also good. Is- but steak tartare. If you just stick that on the menu, <laughs> never take it off. You have or like what's another like LA thing that would like roast beef au jus that was invented in Los Angeles. Have a have an au jus in there. More pot pies. Have a, co- a cob salad, a pot pie. Yeah, I mean throw a Tommy's chili burger in there. Oh, I think mm. they closed Tommy's in uh, San Diego. Yeah, they have closed what? a lot of them. No, they closed the town. Not the one in Barstow. Um. Anyway, uh, I think that's it. I'm now we're going to talk about other things. Uh, didn't have time to get to the tiki room. We will eventually. Uh, uh, we are. We never anything- used our music. <laughs> oh, <of course. laughs> all right. Uh, so we're we're ending the show. Uh, there are other shows that you could. The show to. is done. Uh, the, no this show episodes. is done. Now, what you need to do is go over to other shows. Shows like Years Up which is where uh, Jason talks about how he decided not to go to Disneyland. <laughs> what? Uh, here's up in depth, where uh, Jeremy and Jason have nothing but good things to say about everything. Uh, and it's a delight, and it's not uncomfortable to listen to ever. Uh, and you got uh, PewDiePie, where they talk about tiny things. Uh, also, <laughs> Marvel movies. And Milk Milk Lemonade, Around the Corner Bount the Milk, also known as Bent the Milk Podcast, where they talk about whatever's happening in the Star Wars universe and or galaxy. Uh, may the Force be with you. 
And oh, uh, Scraping the Vault is a show where Jimmy and Audrey and myself watch. Sometimes Eric. Sometimes Eric watch straight to video Disney sequels. Usually Jimmy likes them. I usually hate them. And then we kind of convince Audrey to go to either side with us. And it's really fun. Uh, you can contact us. Jimmy, you said your email earlier. Jhunt at concierge.com. There it is. And Eric? Uh, Eric Pod D at, on, on the Instas. And you can email me. I probably won't read it because I don't check my email, but you're welcome to have it sit there. It's Dan at airsup podcast.com. Uh, you can also and you could also be like the Paul family and book your next oh, Disney cruise. That's with right. Concy ears. That's eight five six hour ears. Or you can email me as at the aforementioned address. The Paul family is going on a Alaskan seven day inside passage cruise in and out of Vancouver. We were able to book their trip and they got an inside stateroom. And we're very excited. They have, uh, I'm, I'm learning a lot. The Disney Wonder is the ship they're going on. And uh, we're excited for them. So thank you for listening, the Paul family. That's and right. look forward to continuing our vacation plan together. So that's Ru, Ru Paul, Rand Paul, Paul McCartney, that's right. uh, Paul from the Bible, and that's right. <laughs> uh, John, the Pope, John Paul. And Lennon. <laughs> John, John Lennon's there too. Uh, they're all going From the together. Bible. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, that's concierge. Uh, and Paul Blart Malkop. <laughs> Paul Blart Mal- Malkop. Uh, He's I, from the I, Talmud. I, other Pauls, I thought of. Um, right. Uh, that's it. Court is adjourned. Goodbye. Be good to each other. Oh, yeah. This is always winning. Fresh face. As I was getting yeah, ready for this, Dan looks I thought, confused. As How's I was getting game? ready for this, everybody's I thought game to myself, is great. <laughs> I thought to myself, "There's no way this is going to be more than two hours." <laughs> <laughs> We've been recording for famous hours. last words. I mean, I'm usually good at kind of predicting where it's going to land time wise. I, I mean, well, we, I took we did a start five thirty minute minutes in. Break. <laughs> took a break. True. That's true. We it's do like have two and a half hours. Let's of show. see. the The before hours was twenty six ish minutes, plus the pee break. Yeah, this is there still one rambling. of our longest episodes ever about two restaurants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, I'm gonna. I made red beans and rice last night, and I'm gonna go have more. Mm, that sounds good. You're welcome, listeners. Really you can also enjoy red beans and rice if you buy red beans and rice and then cook them. <laughs> and andouille sausage and ham. Green peppers. Mm. Green peppers. What sort of sacrilegious? Supreme.